a service of KIVMRadio.com, the Internet's home for an all-old-time radio. Cola, P E P S I, that's your smartest cola buy. Pepsi Cola presents Counter Spy. Washington calling David Harding, Counter Spy. Washington calling David Harding, Counter Spy. Harding, counter spy, calling Washington. United States counter spy, especially appointed to investigate and combat the enemies of our country, both at home and abroad. Tonight, the case of the visiting vultures. Another counter spy report to the American people. Brought to you each Tuesday and Thursday by Pepsi Cola. Pepsi Cola, it's a spot. Two full glasses, that's a lot. That's right, you heard what they said. Two full glasses of sparkling Pepsi from one big 12 ounce bottle. You're getting an extra glass full. And what a delicious glass full. The most refreshing, delightful cola that ever tickled your taste. You can't top Pepsi's tangy flavor. And that big, big bottle saves you money, goes twice as far. Pepsi's America's big, big favorite. And America's biggest cola value. So why take less when Pepsi's best? Whenever you reach for refreshments, remember... Why take less when Pepsi's best? And now, to Counter Spy. In a conference room in Counter Spy Headquarters in Washington, David Harding addresses a group of men around a long, shiny table. Gentlemen, I'm honored by the presence here of the governors of the several southern states covered by our Counter Spy districts 9, 10, and 11. We realize that your state administrations are faced with a large criminal operation, selling illegally made alcohol and evading federal taxes. Peter, those figures, please. Yes, Mr. Harding. District 9, estimated tax loss, $221,000. District 10, $400,000. District 11, over half a million dollars. Now, gentlemen, we don't yet know what gang makes that alcohol or where it's made, but all over your states, counter-spy squads are moving into action. comes the truck, boys. Don't let it get by. It's loaded with one gallon corn syrup cans. That's what you're looking for. Okay, buddy. Pull up. United States counter spy. This is the place. It's a dance hall in Kevin. They won't open up for us. All right, men. Smash down that door. coming fast, but it's got to be stopped. If the truck doesn't stop, blast the tires. Get those tires! So far, gentlemen, no useful leads have been obtained from truck drivers, tavern keepers, and others taken in these counter-spire raids. One lead of possible value has been found, however. My assistant, Harry Peters, is leaving tonight to investigate it in Chicago. Hey, buddy, I'm looking for the main office of the famous Flanagan Sisters Corn Syrup Company. 
Is it in here? No, no, this is only the garage. The office is in that snazzy little building right across the street. Anybody here? something about the famous Flanagan sisters. Why, Buster? I'm Harry Peters, United States Counter Spies. Well, Peters, I got news for you. I'm the famous Flanagan sister. You're the famous Flanagan sister? All of them? <laughs> yeah, it's only a trade name, and I bought the business a couple of years ago. My name's Hype Gordon. Sit down. Thank you, Mr. Gordon. I, uh... You believe in large offices. Why not? I spent half my life here. Is um, this one of your cans of syrup? A sample, yeah. That label, that is a portrait of the original Flanagan sisters bending over a hot stove, making their corn syrup according to uh, a receipt handed down from mother to daughters. Between you and me, the daughter should have it back. <laughs> Tell me, do you know what happens to your used cans? Why? Well, do you take them back, for instance? Like milk bottles, you mean? Mm. <laughs> no. Why? A lot of them seem to be used for shipping illegal alcohol around the country. Labels ripped off, of course. My cans where? Into the so-called monopoly states, where liquor is sold only by state-owned liquor stores. Bootleg liquor undersells those stores very profitably because somebody forgets to pay the federal alcohol taxes. We figure around $3 million on this particular operation alone. Oh, you trace those cans to me, huh? Mm-hmm. Through the manufacturer. <laughs> you want to look around the place, Peter? I'll show you where we make the syrup and can it. Fifty, sixty employees, I got. I'll even show you the garage where we ship it out to stores and wholesalers. Maybe I'll even give you a couple of cans to take home to the little woman. Come on. This way. Listen, counter spy, there's nothing around my plant here. Counter spy? Holy fish. So don't send any more trucks here from the still till you get word from me. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mr. Gordon, you had three trucks loaded and ready to roll out of your garage, didn't you? I got them out fast. So sit tight, Milky, and we'll be okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Peters to Harding in Washington. No evidence whatever at Hype Gordon's syrup plant to connect it or him with illegal alcohol manufacturer. However, have sent agents to trail three loaded trucks that left his garage while I was there. Gordon himself also under surveillance. Has three cars, including limousine with French chauffeur. Lives in the most expensive apartment hotel in Chicago, swarming with uniformed flunkies. Gordon's rental at least fifteen thousand a year for lavishly furnished penthouse apartment. Hey, Sleeping Beauty. Mm-hmm. Oh, <laughs> wake up, sweetheart. Love a boy. Oh, hi. Working, what else? Uh, it's only 12 30, Benny. Say, uh, we got any balmy? Just fell asleep on a goddamn waiting for you. Must be love. <laughs> What's the matter? The famous Flanagan sisters and Uncle Sam. Holy smoke. That? I'm not sure yet. But there's no time for you to get in trouble, lover boy. I still need that second coat. Oh. Hey, I asked you if we got any uh, bologna pumpkin. Oh, oh, yeah. Hi. 
here we are in a month, living in the most expensive apartment with John Chicago. And I have to keep blowing and pumpernickel in the icebox. Refrigerator. What's the matter with baloney? It is so crude. If it was only frog legs and wine or something. But it's baloney and pumpernickel. Thanks. Huh. Want something? Please. Hi. How tough is it with Uncle Sam? No. I figure as long as they don't find out where my spill is, they can't tie me up to it. Oh. I'm just going to sit around and smile. And after a while, the counter spies will figure I'm an innocent victim. And go away. Oh, we still caught somebody at the door without being announced. Maybe it's counter spies. You go on down the hall of the bedroom. Stay there. Go on, go on. Yeah. Let me know what happened. Well, well, see, you look just exactly the way I thought you would. Yes, sir. <laughs> Not one hair out of place. Press the flesh, hypo boy. It's good to see you. Oh, the snap. <laughs> Hell, I, I let go of my hand, will you? How'd you get past the doorman? Oh, my, yes. <laughs> look, do you mind if I drop my suitcase right here? Uh, I'm Sam. Sam? Yes, yeah, Sam Vanderbilt. Your wife's brother, Sam. Sam? Yeah. Oh, Sam. Well, how are you? Oh, great hype, great, just great. Uh, you see, I, I hopped a rattle out of St. Louis early today. Made up my mind to hit for the Windy City. You know, for a decent job. I need scope hype, and there ain't no scope in St. Louis. And uh, just between you and me, I... Uh, I come on ahead of Gladys so I could sneak in a couple of hot nightclubs, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Gladys, uh, come and so. Oh, uh, sure, sure. You see, we thought it was about time we met the man my little sister, Vinnie, married last year. <laughs> hey, say, you've got a mighty classy joint around here. Kind of small, though, ain't it? That's only Vinnie and me, uh, uh... See some back, I better tell you. Oh, don't no, hold it, hold it. Don't bother the height, don't bother its late I could bed down right here. Uh oh. Hey, ain't this one of them sofas that open up into a bed? Hey, this, huh? <laughs> Is it big enough for two? What? Well, you know, Gladys and I wouldn't want inconvenience in that. We'll be mighty comfortable right here in the living room. <laughs> you mean uh, you uh, couldn't get rooms in a hotel? I, 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 uh, I can work it for you. Hotel? Hotel hype? <laughs> When I got relatives I'm as fond of it like you and Vinny, I wouldn't dream of hurting my feelings by going to no hotel. Uh, I'd, uh, oh, oh, baloney and pumpernickel, huh? Oh, good, right, good. Yeah. Honey, I'm sorry there's no frog's leg. Oh, don't feel bad about that hype. I love baloney and pumpernickel. <laughs> glad you're here in Chicago. This new development nails it right to Hype Gordon. He himself ships out alcohol under cover of shipping out corn syrup. But where is the alcohol made? I see only one thing to do, Peters. Pull a new series of raids on his customers in the southern district that might scare him into revealing where he's still located. This tavern is being padlocked for violation of the law. Watch those rear windows. They're trying to get away. All right, step on it, Jack. We'll be late for the next raid. The 
Jura, minha irmã. Vai tomar a copa, Alô, Melky. Hey, Hype. Hype, for the love of Mike, you better come out here to the still. Take it a bad or something. Hey, you know about all these new cottage by raid? Listen, Melky. They can raid every joint in the country. Won't mean nothing to us so long as they don't locate the still. And they won't so long as I don't go there so the counter spies can tell me. You just keep your head down and sit tight. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sit tight. We ought to do something. No. This was another mob muscling in or something like those West Side guys two years ago. I'd go after them with guns. This has to be played close to the best. Okay, Mr. Gordon. Uh, suppose I have to call you later tonight. You're home? Home. I can't go home till way later. My brother-in-law is visiting us. What a schmo. So throw him out. I can't throw him out. My wife sticks up for us. I'm nuts about my wife. And there's my sister-in-law, Gladys. She's tall and skinny. She talks and talks and talks and talks. And I never dream of mentioning it, Jenny. Only after all, you're my sister-in-law. Uh, and you know how Sam would never say a word unless he was sure. Goodness. He said just now that he wasn't sure. Well, after all, a wife ought to know how her husband earns his money. And after all, you only knew how three weeks before you married. I, I know that. Is it? And Sam was always good to me. Especially after Pop died back home. But that doesn't give him or you the right to criticize Hype. I'm not so bothered. Well, all Sam said was that he didn't think the famous Flanagan sister's corn syrup company was very successful. And still, you and Hype have three cars, and you got four closets full of clothes, and that diamond ring. Oh. And, and then yesterday, Sam followed Hype around the city, and Hype didn't go anywhere near any customers. Sam's been cheating. I, I mean, snooping around after Hype. Oh, that's contemptible. Oh, Hype? La, lover boy? You're awfully late. A lot of words coming. Oh. Hello, Brad. Hello. Benny, I'm going to have some bologna and pumpernickel. Where's Sam? Uh, in the kitchen, having some bologna and pumpernickel. <laughs> Time to hit the hay, Benny. Uh, yeah. G- good night, Brad. Good night, Benny. Good night, Hudson. Mm-hmm. Benny, the guy drives me nuts. Who? Who? Sam. I'm Gladys. Now, listen, sweetheart, how about kicking him out? Well, he won't be staying much longer. What do you mean, two years? Now, lover boy. They drive me nuts. They're always in the way. I sleep on a sofa. Drive in. Borrows my shirt. He's my bologna and pumpernickel. Oh, Stop here, yeah. It's getting so the only pleasure I have at home. Just taking off my shoes. <laughs> I can't throw Sam and Gladys out, lover boy. They're all the family I got left. Vinny. Vinny, my customers down south got raided. Oh. I need a clear head, Vinny. And that schmo brother of yours gets me so mad I can't think straight. Listen, you know, I'll, I'll do something dumb. And, honey, it'll be his fault. I'll, I'll murder the guy. Hi, not so loud. My... Oh. Where are my pajamas? Sam got my pajamas? On the pillow. Uh, hi, but I guess this is no time for you to be upset, and I, I better tell you instead of you finding it out. Why not, Warren? Well, uh, Sam follows you around. What? No. He follows me around. Yes. Sam, that iron headed clam digger? I'll brain him now, so help me. I... Where the Sam Hill of my slippers? I, I suppose he's got them too. I love her, boy. Now, please don't make a scene. I'll, uh, I'll get rid of him both by Saturday, I promise. Please, love her, boy. Please. Just a moment, we'll return to Counter Spy. Brought to you by Pepsi Cola. Pepsi Cola, it's the spot. Two full glasses, that's a lot. Lot more value, lot more debt. Buy, take less when Pepsi's best. More and more, among fellows and girls, among mothers and dads, you hear that same and sensible question. 
Why take less when Pepsi's best? No budget, no allowance ever had a better friend than tangy, sparkling Pepsi-Cola. Because one big 12-ounce Pepsi bottle gives you two delicious drinks. That's twice as much tangy taste, twice as much delicious Pepsi to go just twice as far. That's why more and more families say, why take less when Pepsi's best? Yes, families like yours and mine. Families all over America, they're all saying, why take less when Pepsi's best? Pepsi Cola, it's a spot, tastes terrific when you're hot, more and better than the rest. Why take less when Pepsi's best? Today, tomorrow, always, get America's biggest cola value. Take home a carton of six big, big Pepsi bottles. Insist on Pepsi at the store. And say Pepsi at the fountain. Say Pepsi at the stand. Say Pepsi. Whenever you reach for refreshment, remember... Why take less when Pepsi's best? And now, back to Counter Spy. Peter, I've been studying the surveillance reports on Hype Gordon. Yeah, me too, Dave. He hasn't made a single betraying move. It's great. We smash his customers, stop the tax losses, we know he ships out the alcohol. But what we don't know is where's that still? On the moon, maybe. Well, I've got one notion that might be useful. Did you notice in these reports about Hype Gordon's brother and sister-in-law visiting? And driving him crazy, yes. Peter's relatives and in-laws often make trouble for decent people. Why not trouble for crooks, too? I think this Mr. Sam Vandervoort might be a lot of help to us. With a push from you. And Sam, maybe I shouldn't have said anything about you falling hype around, but it, it just sort of popped out. Oh, well, glad is it don't make no difference. I couldn't find anything out anyway. Huh? I guess we'll have to go back to St. Louis Saturday, maybe. Where are they tonight, Hype and Vinny? I don't know. We got the apartment all to ourselves, and I must say it's a relief to have a little privacy. Oh, somebody's at the door. Uh, you go, Sam, and if it's a telegram or anything for Hype, you better open it in case it's important. Uh, yeah? Is this Hype in? Hype Gordon? No. No, he's not. Can I give him a message? You a friend of his? No, I'm his, I'm his brother-in-law. Oh, well, give him this message, will you? Rush. Tell him to get out to the still right away. Get out to the still right away? Uh, what name will I tell him? He'll know where the message is from. So long. Who was it, Sam? Telegram or special delivery? Sam, I asked you a question. Why don't you answer me? Sam, something's happening. I can always tell by your face whenever you've got an idea. Now, why don't you huh? tell me? What? I said... I was thinking oh, shut that... up, will you? Oh. I'm trying to think. Vinny! Vinny, it's me. Sam? What is? Oh, well, nobody... Yeah. Hi, this is Vinny. Where have you been? To the athletic club, like I told you. Where are you? I drove Sam out here. Only half the minute we got here and told Milky, he got all excited and ran away. Oh, all the other men, too. Milky? The other men? Vinny, are you with the still? With Sam? I couldn't help it. I the minute Sam told me about the message he got. When we couldn't find you, we didn't dare wait. Vinny... I don't know what's going on, but I'm going to kill somebody for it. Don't move. Don't do anything. I'll come right out. Hype. You, you don't have to yell at me. I was only trying to help. 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 Yeah. You and Sam together. You've made me do the one thing I swore I'd never do. Come out to the cell so I could be tailed. Hype, you've got me and Vinny all wrong about it. Sam, you shut up. Now, what'd you bring that idiot along for, too? Me? Gladys? Look. Now, look, all of you. I'm trying to find a hand on this. On what happened? Now, what happened? Well, 
Well, while we were out, you and me, Daddy, it's high. A guy Stop. come to the door with a message for you to get out to the still right away. A guy? What yeah. guy? Well, I thought he was sent by Milky. Milky wouldn't send a guy phone. And so you came out here. Sam, what did you butt in? Oh, Hype, you'd better listen to what I got to say. Tell him, Sam. Gladys, you shut up or I'll brain you. Oh. All right, let's have it, Sam. All right. You think I'm a charter here, don't you? But I figured out right from the start you had a racket, and the minute that guy talked about a still, I was sure of it. So, so? So I want a job. Here, working for you. We're at the famous Flanagan Sisters Corn Syrup Company. Or else I tore. Sam! You told me you only wanted to help, Hyde. Shut up, Penny. You'll talk, Sam. To the counter spies. Oh, bright eyes, you listen to me. Now hold your horses, Hyde. Just give me a job and I won't talk. Talk, you big baboon, you! That message wasn't for Milky. It was a counter spy gag, a trap, and you walked into it. I gotta walk into it, too, to get you out. Give me a job, he says. Give me a job, you rock head. I, ought to, I might be out of business altogether before morning. Oh, hype. I don't buy all that hype. You can't brush me off that easy. What? Vinny. Hmm? Go on out to the car. Stay there. We may have to leave fast. I'll douse all the lights in here. Sam, you win. You and Gladys, come on with me. I'll show you something. <laughs> Flashlight shows now? Yeah, of course, met upstairs. From here, through this cellar, the alcohol gets piped to my corn syrup factory. Our pipeline runs two miles in a, an abandoned sewer we found. Gosh, what a setup. Hype, I sure got a hand it to you, fella. I'm glad it's. Yeah, it's remarkable. Sam, how would you like to stay here? To uh, work here? Sam. Sam, he's up to something. Uh, Hi. You take us out of this cellar this minute. Yeah. Yeah, I... Uh, let's talk about it outside. Well, yeah. talk right here. I don't believe there was any message. You rushed Vinny off her feet. Now you want to sneak out and squeal on me. You're rotten kind of spy stool. What, me? You're crazy. Get it out of here. Hi. You have to go. Sam will be quiet. You stay here with him, Gladys. It'll be dark. No air. We'll die down here, you murderous. So long, both of you. For good. Hi. Hi. Penny, why aren't you outside like I told you? Cars all around. I get scared. It's so dark and creepy here. Cars? Holy uh, smoke, we got to get out of here. We can't leave Sam and Gladys. Never mind them. Come on, there's a side door. But Sam and Gladys... Oh, it's all right. There they are. What? Oh, that doorway over there from the cellar where you were just saw flashlight. Sam! Gladys, over here! Gordon, Mrs. Gordon, stand where you are. How does fire, Gordon? Penny, what's that? Open, Gordon, drop the gun. Look out! Stop resisting, Gordon. You're powerfully thrown it. I don't fuck you'll get hurt. That's better. Hands up for Gordon Peterson. It's a pleasure. Gordon, you and all of your men are under arrest for making and selling illegal alcohol. Just now as we came in, we found Sam Vandervoort and his wife in the cellar. You'll be charged with their attempted murder. Hi! You didn't. Sam's a dirty stool pigeon. Oh. He was working for the counter spots. My own brother-in-law. You're wrong, Gordon. We only tricked him to trick you into leading us here to your still. Now your entire racket smashed. All right, Peters, have these people held outside. Then we'll start taking this place apart. When your friends drop in, be generous, but be thrifty, too. Serve plenty of delicious Pepsi-Cola. Pepsi's big 12-ounce bottle gives you not just one sparkling glass full, but two. Get a carton of six and serve 12 delicious drinks. Yes, Pepsi is America's biggest cola value. You get twice the tangy taste, twice the refreshment, twice the Pepsi. So why take less when Pepsi is best? 
Whenever you reach for refreshment, remember... Pepsi Cola, it's the spot, two full glasses, that's a lot. Lot more value, lot more depth. Why take less when Pepsi's best? Tune in every Tuesday and Thursday, same time, same station to Counter Spy. Listen on Thursday for the exciting Counter Spy case of the Vicious Visitor. Tangling with the criminal I call the Vicious Visitor was dangerous for all concerned. For his prison guards, it meant a beating in the dark. For his partner, bullets. And for the woman who had once known him, it meant death for her husband, death for herself. I invite you to be tuned in on Thursday to Case of the Vicious Visitor on Counter Spy. Tonight's Counter Spy program originated in New York, was directed by Leonard L. Bass, dramatized by Paul Milton, and featured Don McLaughlin and Mandel Kramer with music by Jesse Crawford. Counter Spy is a Phillips H. Lord production for Pepsi Cola. Enjoy some Pepsi ice cold tonight. <laughs> That's your smartest cola buy. Pepsi Cola presents Counter Spy. Washington calling David Harding, Counter Spy. Washington calling David Harding, Counter Spy. Harding, Counter Spy. Calling Washington. United States Counterspies. Especially appointed to investigate and combat the enemies of our country, both at home and abroad. Tonight, the case of a vicious visitor. Another Counterspy report to the American people. Brought to you each Tuesday and Thursday by Pepsi Cola. Pepsi Cola, hit the spot, two full glasses, that's a lot. That's right, you heard what they said. Two full glasses of sparkling Pepsi from one big 12 ounce bottle. You're getting an extra glass full. And what a delicious glass full. The most refreshing, delightful cola that ever tickled your taste. You can't top Pepsi's tangy flavor. And that big, big bottle saves you money, goes twice as far. Pepsi is America's big, big favorite and America's biggest cola value. So why take less when Pepsi's best? Whenever you reach for refreshment, remember... Why take less when Pepsi's best? And now, to Counter Spy. A penitentiary, its high, thick walls looming black in the darkness. Inside, a sudden flood of searchlights illuminates every corner. Gates clang shut. And a siren wails frighteningly into the night. Attention. Attention all posts. Special alert. Block all exits. This is Warden Dean. Prisoner 196523, Rocky James. Escaped from prison workshop three minutes ago. Block all exits. And be careful. James is armed. He's a psychotic murderer and will shoot to kill. Yeah, I'll admit it. You got the clothes? Yeah, in the car. All right. I can change on the way. The yeah. are getting closer. Come on, let's get going. Oh, thank God, Al. Where's the car? 
I rest that it, Eddie Rocky. Uh, Road cut through this swamp just a few feet ahead. Oh, it's getting closer, Rocky. I got this far. I'll, I'll get the rest of the way. I hope. There's a car. That was in the back seat. You can change it. <laughs> what? Rocky, I'm hit. <laughs> a couple of shots might hold him off a minute. Now, <laughs> come on, get in the back. Quick. Can't move. All right, come on. I'll help you in. Come on. Give up. Rocky, you ain't got a chance. Give up. No chance, huh? I got this far. You watch me get the rest of the way. To David Harding, Chief United States Counter Spies, Washington. From Warden Deans, Alderlander Federal Penitentiary, Maxton City. Rocky Gaines, serving time here for armed bank robbery, made successful break 5 p.m. this date. After gun battle with prison search squad in nearby swamp, Gaines and unidentified companion made getaway in black Buick sedan. Rocky, where you driving it? We gotta ditch this car, Al. These woods are as good a spot as any. Rocky, them bump! Every back here, the bump is killed me. All shot up. Oh, they got money on the two. You don't hear me yapping, do you? Hurts, Rocky. I didn't hurt. Yeah. Oh. Okay, we'll leave the jalopy here. Come on, Al. Get out of that back seat. I can't. Out, I said. We gotta keep moving. Yeah, Rocky, I swear. It's down to my leg, mate. Can't move. Rocky, I'll wait here for you. What do you mean, wait? you got to get me a doc, Rocky. Please, Rocky, a doc's the only one that can help oh, me. Oh, sure, sure. Doc, I'll say, come with me and help my pal. He got shot helping me break out of the pen. Sure, you come running. you got to do something. I can't take it. It's like a fire inside of me. You're my pal. you got to do something. Okay, Al, I'll, I'll do something for you. Rocky, that gun. What's the idea? I told you I'd do something, didn't I? This will put you out of your misery. Rocky, don't. You're going to die anyway. I'm doing you a Rocky, favor. Don't pull that trigger. Come along, Al. Wait, See wait. you around. Rocky, I... To David Harding, Washington, from Conway, now at Albany Field Office. Black Buick sedan used by Rocky Gaines in prison break. Found in Woods 16 miles north of here. Bullet riddled body of unidentified man found in back seat. For identification and forwarding fingerprints, bullets removed from body and blood sample. Go ahead, Chief. Harding, Washington, to Conway, Albany. Identification reports that fingerprints of the dead man are those of Alvin Troy, alias Al Trojan, formerly a sidekick of Rocky Gaines. We're working on blood samples you forwarded in the laboratory. How's it coming, Dr. Lowe? Well, I've finished the blood test, Mr. Harding. And? I'll have a look. Uh, this microscope first. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a specimen of the blood we found in the rear seat of the getaway car. Type O. The dead man, Al Trojan, had type O. Yes, sir. <clears throat> now, look at the specimen under this other microscope. See, that's a smear we got from the front seat of the car. That's different. <laughs> it certainly is. Type B blood. Which means that the man driving the getaway car was Rocky Gaines. And he must have been wounded by the prison guards, too. Undoubtedly. Well, Dr. Lawton, when the other reports are completed, let me know. Uh -huh. I'll be back in my office with Harry Peters. And the lab 
blood test seat has proved that the blood stains on the front and rear seats of the car were of different types. Now, what did ballistics dig up about the bullets in Trojan's body? Something even more interesting, Dave. Of the five slugs probed out of Al Trojan's body, only two were thirty caliber. The other three were forty fives. What? Yes, sir. And the prison guards used thirty caliber rifles. And we know that Rocky Gaines was armed with a revolver, undoubtedly a forty five. Nice boy, Rocky Gaines. Yes, this means he murdered his own partner. Rocky must have figured that Al Trojan wounded was a dead weight on his hands. And dead men tell no tales, especially to the police. Well, from all we know about Gaines, this doesn't surprise me, Peter. According to the prison report, Gaines is a psychotic, triggered finger type, a purely emotionless killer without normal human conscience. Special coming in on the radio, Dave. Harding, go ahead. Conway, Mr. Harding. I'm in Tannersville. I got a lead on Rocky Gaines. Let's have him. Less than an hour ago, a motorist picked up a hitchhiker on a back road 20 miles from here. And then at gunpoint, the driver was forced out of his car and left high and dry. The driver identifies the hitchhiker as Rocky Gaines? Positively. What direction did he drive off? North. All right, Conway. From now on, we'll use Tannersville as the focal point of our operation. Set up an emergency base for us there. Right, Chief. Why Tannersville, Dave? Look at this map, Peter. Here's Tannersville. The last large town this side of those mountains. Now, you heard Conway. Rocky was driving north. Which means he's probably headed into the mountains, hmm? Right. And with the local police, we'll set up blocks at every intersection of those mountain roads. Rocky may get into those mountains, but he has at least one bullet wound. Sooner or later, he'll have to get help up there or come out for it. And when he does, we'll have to be close by or some innocent people may get killed. <laughs> Well, this boat engine sounds kind of peculiar to me. Oh, Cliff, there isn't a thing wrong with a boat, and you know it. Well, it still sounds funny. I can't put my finger now, on it. Now, darling, topic. you're just looking for another excuse to take the motor apart again. Now, isn't that it? Trouble with you, Mrs. Bentonage. You know too darn much about me. <laughs> well, no. Imagine a husband admitting that. Hey, you're running a fight into the city. Oh, I am. <laughs> I'm sorry. All right, I'll bring it in easy. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Okay, kill the motor. Huh? This is a nice landing. Thank you. Uh, Anything especially want in town, Norma? Uh, no. I, oh, yes. Yes, Cliff. Will you stop by Jane Tompkins and ask if she heard anything about that material I ordered? Jane Tompkins' material. Anything else? Not a thing. I'll be back to pick you up here at 12. All right, honey. Here at the jetty at 12. Bye. <sighs> nice clothes you got there, lady. Oh. Oh, thanks. My husband takes a lot of pride in it. Looks like things turned out okay for you, Norma. What? What's the matter, Norma? Don't you remember me? An old friend like me? Take another look. Lucky game. Uh, it's been a long time, huh, baby? How many years? Fifteen? Still don't look a day over twenty. What are you doing here? You don't look so glad to see your old friend, Rocky. You and me used to get along swell in the old days, remember? Norma and Rocky? <laughs> Quite a pair. What do you want, Rocky? For old times' sake, baby, just a little favor. What kind of a favor? I happened to be in the neighborhood, and I remember hearing that after you left town, you come up here and married yourself a square. Some guy from duck hunting blinds on that island on the lake. Yes, we lived there, Cliff and I. I figured that island's just about the right place for me to lay low a while to a heat off. Well, what do you say, Norma, baby? For old times' sake? I'm sorry, Rocky. I got a slug in my shoulder. I need a doc to take care of it. I got a healthy water bill. You'll get nice room and board. No, I won't do it, Rocky. I can't. I'll, I'll just pretend that you weren't here. But I didn't see you. You pretend, huh? It's the best I can do, Rocky. The best you can do? Now, you listen to me. I'm wise to your setup, baby. Nobody around here is supposed to know what you were before you came here. You're a nice, sweet lily of the valley in these parts, Rocky, huh? I've changed. I'm different. Norma, baby. That character Cliff who got out of that boat a few minutes ago. You two looked awful happy from where I was standing. Ever tell your husband about the old days, Norma? About yourself and Rocky Gaines? <laughs> no, I guess you didn't. 
Now, you wouldn't want to spoil everything and make Mr. Benton unhappy, would you? Of all the places in the world, why did you have to come here? Uh, baby, I knew you'd come through for an old friend. Oh. Now, after you take me over to your island, you call the town doctor and tell him there was a gun accident. But Cliff, what will I tell Cliff? Let's tell your husband that an old friend named uh, Steve Evans is staying for a visit. Now, turn that motor over, baby. Let's get out to that island fast. Conway. Uh, just off a dirt road called Elder Lane, nine miles south of Crystal Lake. All right, Conway, we'll head that way. Better step on the seat. Right, Dave. We'll have to turn on to Route 16A for Crystal Lake. Crystal Lake. It means Rocky's still moving north. Yes. Without a car, he's going to be slowed down. Dave, now we can start closing in on Rocky Games from all sides. Yes, and let's hope we get him before any innocent bystanders excite his murder-mad mind. In just a moment, we'll return to Counter Spy, brought up to you by Pepsi-Cola. Pepsi-Cola, it's the spot, two full glasses, that's a lot. Lots more value, lots more debt. Why take less when Pepsi's best? More and more, among fellows and girls, among mothers and dads, you hear that sane and sensible question. Why take less when Pepsi's best? No budget, no allowance, ever had a better friend than tangy, sparkling Pepsi-Cola. Because one big 12-ounce Pepsi bottle gives you two delicious drinks. That's twice as much tangy taste. Twice as much delicious Pepsi to go just twice as far. That's why more and more families say, why take less when Pepsi's best? Yes, families like yours and mine, families all over America, they're all saying, why take less when Pepsi's best? Pepsi Cola, it's a spot, tastes terrific when you're hot, more and better than the rest. Why take less when Pepsi's best? Today, tomorrow, always. Get America's biggest total value. Take home a carton of six big, big Pepsi bottles. Insist on Pepsi at the store. And say Pepsi at the fountain. Say Pepsi at the stand. Say Pepsi. Whenever you reach for refreshment, remember... Why take less when Pepsi says... Now back to Counter Spy. David Harding and his assistant, Harry Peters, looking for the escaped federal prisoner and murderer, Rocky Gaines, are now in the office of a Dr. Raymond Vincent in the town of Greendale on the shore of Crystal Lake. Dr. Vincent, this is my assistant, Harry Peters. How do you do, Mr. Peters? Dr. Vincent. Well, now, if you will tell us the story, Doctor. Well, of course, Mr. Harding can't have any bearing on your case, but that man of yours who stopped by here was so dead set in my telling you. Well, please go ahead, Dr. Benson. Well, it was like this. Now, yesterday morning, the phone rings. It's uh, Norma Benton, place over on Mallard Island. Mallard Island? Uh, that's a big island a few miles out in the lake. It's called Mallard on account it's a dandy spot for duck hunters. As a matter of fact, it's the best darn spot in the state, Cliff Benton and his wife, Norma, the only ones who live on Mallard. Cliff keeps the duck blinds in repair. County pays for it, you know. It brings business uh, here. Well, Doctor, what about Mrs. Benton's telephone call? Well, it seems Norma Benton's got a friend that came to visit. A uh, friend's name is, um... No, uh, uh, it wasn't it. Uh, I have it here on the card. It... Evans, that's what it is. Steve, Steve Evans. Steve Evans. And then, Doctor... Well, it seems Norma was showing this Steve Evans fella some of Cliff's guns, and one of the darn things goes off, and this friend is shot right smack in the shoulder. You have quite a few accidents like that up here. You know, you've got to be careful with firearms. Uh, Doctor, do you have the bullet you extracted? Well, we usually do, you know, but this friend of Norma Benton's, uh, what in tarnation was his name? I, well, I got it here on the card, and Steve Evans. That's it, Evans, yeah. You've got a good memory, son. 
Well, this Steve Evans tells me he'd like to keep the bullet for a souvenir of his visit to Crystal Lake. Some folks are kind of funny that way, you know. I once knew a fellow... Well, Roger, we won't take up any more huh? time. Thank you very much. Well, you're entirely welcome. I suppose I wasn't of much help to you, though. Well, you never can tell, Doctor. Goodbye. Goodbye, gentlemen. What do you think, Dave? I'll bet you my pension that the Benton's visitor is Rocky Gaines. Hop in, Peter. Uh. Harding to Conway in master control car. Conway to Harding. Standing by. Believe we've located Rocky Gaines on Mallard Island in Crystal Lake. Have all mobile squads in area report to me at Lake Shore Town of Greendale. That is all. The wind up, Dave? Well, not just yet, Peters. I'm interested in Norma and Cliff Benton. Well, why should they protect and harbor a criminal? Suppose they don't know who he really is? Well, in that case, those two are in terrible danger. Rocky Gaines is a pathological killer. If we make any hasty move, he might murder them. That's true. On the other hand, the doctor told us that... Steve Evans was an old friend of Mrs. Norma Benton. Peters, before we close in on Mallard Island, I want a complete checkup on Norma Benton. Then we'll know how to handle this capture. Dinner, Mrs. Benton. Norma's my favorite cook, Mr. Evans. Uh, you're lucky to have a wife like her. Yes, don't I know it. But Norma, dear, you, you haven't said a word all evening. Is there something wrong? No. You uh, you hardly ate anything, did I wasn't very hungry, Cliff. Oh, something on your mind, maybe, Mrs. Benton? No, there is nothing on my mind. Norma, dear, something is bothering me. Uh, you, you haven't been all right for the past few days. Well, what is it, dear? I'm all right, Cliff. How many times do I have to tell you I'm perfectly all right? Now, let me alone. Norma, wait. I, I... just want to be let alone. Norma. Well, looks like uh, I maybe started something, Mr. Benton. No, no, it, uh, it's not your fault, Mr. Evans. Only I, I... I can't understand what's gotten into she, uh, she was always so happy here, you know, on the island. It's such a safe, peaceful place. Yeah, Mr. Benjamin. This island is about the safest place I've ever been in my life. All right, Scott. Thanks very much. Peter, you get all that on the extension? All of it, Dave. This is Norma Benton, formerly Norma Marcy, entertainer at the Black Grotto in Bayside from 1931 to 1934. An old flame of Rocky Gaines. That undoubtedly means Mrs. Benton is giving help to Rocky. Yes, Peter. She's hiding him. Now we know how to handle this. Yes, I'm Norma Benton. What is it? I've been waiting for you to come over here from the island. But uh, who are you? Agent Harry Peters, United States Counter Spies. Come with me, please. And that's the story, Mr. Hardy. Rocky Gaines forced himself on you. I, I had to take him in. You had to? Why? Because I didn't want Cliff. That's my husband to find out what I was once. I didn't want to hurt him. I see. Can you understand what I mean, Mr. Hardy? Well, yes, Mrs. Benton, but there are a great many people like you who make the same mistake. Once you were in a bad crowd, but at least you had the sense to get out. You have nothing to be ashamed of. Some people don't see it that way. The right people do, Mrs. Benton. And from everything I know about your husband, he's certainly one of the right people. I was crazy to help Rocky, I know. If I had come to you in the beginning, Cliff wouldn't be in such danger now. Danger? What do you mean, Mrs. Benton? Rocky warned me not to let Cliff leave the island until after he's gone. 
He keeps his eye on Cliff all the time. Follows him, never lets Cliff out of his sight. And Rocky always has that gun with him. He told me that if anything goes wrong, if I make just one slip, he'll kill Cliff. Mr. Hardy, this is Cliff Benton. Cliff Benton, yeah. Norma's not in the house now, but she told me about your talk with her. Rocky Gaines finally went to sleep. I just checked to make sure. All right. Peter's now start for your island right away. All right. The mooring's on the south shore. I know. We should be there in less than 20 minutes. I'll be waiting for you, Mr. Hardy. gets here, and then I start. Now it on and just ahead to this. Make for the jetty on the south side, Peter. Right. Peter, Mike, through the trees. That light. Mike, right in the center of the island. Over there. I see it. That's the attic light in the Benton house. Norma Benton's danger signal to us. Something must have gone haywire. Maybe Rocky tumbles with the plan. Let's get to shore. I'll make it fast. Did you see the attic signal? Yes. Last I heard was from your husband. What happened? I was outside the room when Cliff called you. Rocky caught him at it, so I switched on the signal right in the attic and ran down here. We'll go right up to the house. Yes, but Mr. Harding, Rocky plans to kill us all. Cliff, me, and you. He's waiting for you to arrive. But if he finds out that I'm gone, he won't wait. He has Cliff in the living room. Peter, it says. We'll have to improvise fast. Now, you circle around the house. I'll have to take a chance of going up the front way with Mrs. Benton. There's a back door to the living room, isn't there, Mrs. Benton? Yes. Okay, Peter. You come in through the back. I'll try to stall Rocky again while I jockey him into position. Now, your cue to come in will be, will be this sentence. Don't be a fool, Rocky. You got it? Don't be a fool, Rocky. I'll set on it, Dave. I better get a shot, Dave. Cliff! Back too Mrs. Benton, wait! Don't go back there alone! Wait! Thank heaven it was. Those shots, Mr. Benton. What happened? Where's Rocky Dean? Right here, Harding. Ooh. Behind you. Oh. Get your hands up, Harding. You and Benton both. That's it. Now keep him that way. By the way, Harding, where are all your boys? I saw you come up the path alone. I came over alone, Gaines, to talk sense to you. Yeah? What kind of sense? Give yourself up, Rocky. You haven't got a chance of getting away from this place alive. <laughs> Look who's telling me about getting out alive. There are counter spies stationed all along the shore. Don't be a fool, Rocky. Fool, huh? I got out the toughest spot from this. After I set this house on fire, your Boy Scouts will all come over here on the double. That's when I make my break with the boat. I told you before, you haven't got a chance in the world. Don't be a fool, Rocky. Shut up. You're holding up this party, and at this party, Harding, you're the guest of honor. And like they say, a guest of honor should get the first helping. <laughs> Dave. Oh, you're telling me, Peter. What happened to you? I said the signal sentence twice, Dave. Believe it or not, those woods out back are thicker than we figured. It took me a while to get through. It's a good thing they weren't any thicker. All right, Mrs. Benton? A little shaky, but... Yes, all right. 
Of course, Ed. We're both very grateful to you, Mr. Harding, for saving our lives and our life together. Well, it cost Rocky James his life. And that closes the case of your vicious visitor. <laughs> When your friends drop in, be generous, but be thrifty, too. Serve plenty of delicious Pepsi-Cola. Pepsi's big 12-ounce bottle gives you not just one sparkling glass full, but two. Get a carton of six and serve 12 delicious drinks. Yes, Pepsi is America's biggest cola value. You get twice the tangy taste, twice the refreshment, twice the Pepsi. So why take less when Pepsi is best? Whenever you reach for refreshment, remember... Pepsi Cola, hits the spot, two full glasses, that's a lot. Lots more value, lots more debt. Why take less when Pepsi best? This is David Harding again. A special word to employers. Give word to our handicapped veterans. Next time a job opens, write to Captain Maurice Witherspoon. Masonic Veterans Committee, 71 West. 23rd Street, New York City. Give our fighting men a fighting chance for rehabilitation. Tune in every Tuesday and Thursday, same time, same station to Counter Spy. Listen next Tuesday for the exciting Counter Spy case of the sweepstake murders. When frightened witnesses could gasp only murdered by a golden sword. When strange and eerie sounds came from the depths of a ship. When a man had to be shot at to make him talk. These were some of the elements your counter spies face in our next case. Tune in on Tuesday to Case of the Sweet State Murders on Counter Spy. Tonight's Counter Spy program originated in New York, was directed by William M. Sweet, dramatized by Edward J. Adamson and feature Don McLaughlin and Mandel Kramer with music by Jesse Crawford. Counter Spy is a Philip H. Lord production for Pepsi-Cola. Enjoy some Pepsi, ice cold tonight. P-E-P-S-I, that's your smartest cola buy. Pepsi Cola presents Counter Spy. Washington calling David Harding, Counter Spy. Washington calling David Harding, Counter Spy. Harding, Counter Spy. Calling Washington. United States Counterspire, especially appointed to investigate and combat the enemies of our country, both at home and abroad. Tonight, the case of the Sweet State Murders, another Counterspire report to the American people. Brought to you each Tuesday and Thursday by Pepsi Cola. Pepsi Cola hits the spot. Two full glasses, that's a lot. That's right, you heard what they said. Two full glasses of sparkling Pepsi from one big 12 ounce bottle. You're getting an extra glass full. And what a delicious glass full. The most refreshing, delightful cola that ever tickled your taste. You can't top Pepsi's tangy flavor. And that big, big bottle saves you money, goes twice as far. Pepsi is America's big, big favorite. And America's biggest cola value. So why take less when Pepsi is best? Whenever you reach for refreshment, remember... Why take less when Pepsi is best? And now, to Counter Spy. It was a moonless night 
in the small southern town of Gulfport, near the Mexican border. In a dimly lit, evil-smelling corridor of a rooming house, two shadowy men stood before a closed door. Tom, you sure this is the room? Positive, Sheriff. Let's go in. Wait, wait, Tom. Get away from the door. But what? Get back alongside it. That's it. Let's see if it's unlocked. It is unlocked. No light in the room. Now listen. I'm going to shut the door open, shine my light in. You stay right where you are till I tell you. Okay, Sheriff. What the... Come on, Tom. What is it? Look. There on the floor. What? It's Frenchy. What's left of him? His chest. Look at his chest. What? I don't know what did it. I've never seen anything like this. It's obvious, Uncle Cy. The big shots in the sweepstakes racket found out Frenchie was going to talk to a newspaper reporter. Me. So they killed him. I never saw anything so... so horrible. It's an outrage, Tom. But if they think they've stopped me, they got another thing coming. I found something in Frenchie's room tonight which just might lead me to the men we want. No? Mm-hmm. What did you find? Well, I'll tell you all about it when I bring in the story. I've got to be on my way. Yeah, no, no, Tom. One man's been murdered already. I don't want anything to happen to you. Oh, now, look, Uncle Si, this is a terrific story. Thousands and thousands of Americans are buying tickets on what's supposed to be an official Mexican sweepstakes. But the Mexican government says it doesn't know anything about yes, it. Yes, 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 I and know. And tonight the racketeers proved they're murderers, too. Is the Gulfport Gazette going to laugh that off? Well, that's not the point, Tom. I can't let my own nephew risk his life. Your nephew has to take the same chance as any other reporter would take. Mm-hmm. See you later, Uncle Si. <laughs> Hello? Is Tom Fisher there? No, he's not, but this is his wife, Ruth. Can I take a message? Yeah. Tell him to lay off the big story he's working on. Unless he wants the same thing to happen to him that happened to Frenchie. Tom, that man on the phone frightened me. Darling, please drop the story you're working on. Drop the biggest story that ever came my way? Don't be silly, Ruth. But I don't want anything to happen to you. Nothing's going to happen to me. Now, where... Oh, here it is. What's that? Oh, something I picked up in Frenchie's room. Looks like a poker chip. Uh Uh-huh. Well, I've got to get moving. Where are you going? No, no, no. You're forgetting the rules. When Papa goes out on a big story, Mama doesn't ask questions. Tom, don't go. Hey, stop it now. Relax. I'll be back soon. Hey, you in the launch. You got room for one more? I'm going out to the gambling ship, too. Toro? Yes, Monk. Big spending crowd aboard tonight, Toro. Here's the take from the wheel so far. How much, Monk? Twenty-one hundred bucks. And the launch is still bringing the suckers out here to this ship. Not bad, huh? No, Chris. No, he's not bad. What are you counting for? Don't you trust me? Just as far as, uh, how do you say? I can see. Oh, now, look, Toro. No. Do I'm enjoy to count the money. Much money. Yeah. You ought to be having the time of your life, then, the way that stuff is rolling in. The door, Monk. The back door. Okay. Who is it? Hey, Johnny, open up. Yeah, all right. Get in. Okay, okay. Get out of my back. What the... 
That's Tom Fisher, the reporter. Why? That's right, Toro. Got him snooping around below decks. You know where. So, Senor Fisher. You uh, have found what you expected below? Huh? Why, uh, I don't know what you mean. Uh, now... You're a poor liar, senor. Nor are you wise. You should have heeded the advice conveyed to your wife. Then she uh, would not become a widow. A what? Now, listen, Tor... No, you... senor. That I was once a matador, a fighter of bulls. No, I... Uh... This case contains two of my favorite swords. This gold-hilted one was presented to me by enthusiastic aficionados in Mexico City after a corrida in which I dispatched six of the bravest and fiercest bulls ever seen in any arena. As you see, from the side the blade appears to be a straight. But if you hold it this way, Observe how the blade curves to penetrate to the bull's heart. And now, senor bull, I am sighting on your heart. Here's Arango, where you said that paper mill's located. Mm-hmm. And here's Gulfport, 
About a hundred miles away. Peters, we've got to shortcut the job of tracing this paper. I want you to grab the first plane for Gulfport and go to work. <laughs> Did your husband tell you where he was going that night? The last time you saw him? I asked him, but he wouldn't tell me, Mr. Peters. I begged him not to go. <laughs> now try to put yourself together. Come on now. I'm sorry. That's good. Now, Tom's editor, his uncle, said Tom didn't have any real clue to the men behind the phony sweepstakes racket. Did Tom tell you anything that he didn't tell his uncle? No. Tom said he just looked around the room of that poor man who'd who been murdered. Frenchy, yes. Now, try to remember, Mrs. Fisher, this is very important. Tom may have said something which we might use as a clue, some some little thing. But he didn't. We had a rule. There was something. Yes? A, a poker chip. A golden poker chip. A poker chip? Only this one was gold, and it had the picture of a bull on it. Tom said he found it in Frenchy's room. Well, ordinary poker chips aren't usually gold. They're white, red, or blue. But they do have gold chips for high-priced ones in gambling houses. Are there any gambling houses in Gulfport, you know? Not in town, but there's a ship out in the Gulf, a converted yacht, where people go to dine and dance and gamble. El Toro told us. Very popular. Okay. Well, Toro means bull in Spanish, and there was a picture of a bull on the chip your husband had. Oh. Mr. Peters, do you think that's where Tom went that night? It could be. That's where I'm going now. I'll go with you. No, no, Mrs. Fisher. This might be dangerous. I don't care. I want to find the man who killed my husband. Mrs. Fisher, that's my job. You stay here, and I'll keep in touch with you. I'll see you later. Oh. Good evening, Mr. Peters. Ruth Fisher, what are you doing here? I told you I want to find the man who killed my husband. And I told you to... Well, what's the use? You're here now. Have you found out anything? No, not yet. I've been circulating around in the crowd, but so... See, there it is again. What? You hear that sound? Kind of dull hammering. It's coming from below decks. Yes, I hear it. It's probably the yacht's engine. But we're not moving. Ventilator points? No. Sounds more like. What? There's too much noise in here. Come out on deck where we can hear better. Hmm? Yes. Pardon? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Excuse me. I'm sorry. Excuse me. Yeah. Wait. Yes, by George, I think I know what that sound is. What? A printing press. A printing press out here on the boat? I'm sure it is. It seems to be coming from below decks. Come on, Mrs. Fisher. The stairs are over here. Look out, Mr. Peters. There are two men behind you. What? Oh! I've got it. Oh, you killed Mr. Peters. Just a moment, we'll return to Counter Spy. Brought to you by Pepsi Cola. Pepsi Cola, it's a spot. Two full glasses, that's a lot. Lots more value, lots more zest. Why take less when Pepsi's best? More and more, among fellows and girls, among mothers and dads, you hear that sane and sensible question Why take less when Pepsi is best? No budget, no allowance ever had a better friend than tangy, sparkling Pepsi Cola. Because one big 12 ounce Pepsi bottle gives you two delicious drinks. That's twice as much tangy taste, twice as much delicious Pepsi to go just twice as far. That's why more and more families say, why take less when Pepsi is best? Yes, families like yours and mine, families all over America, 
They're all saying, why take less when Pepsi is best? Pepsi Cola hits the spot, tastes terrific when you're hot, more and better than the rest. Why take less when Pepsi is best? Today, tomorrow, always. Get America's biggest cola value. Take home a carton of six big, big Pepsi bottles. Insist on Pepsi at the store. And say Pepsi at the fountain. Say Pepsi at the stand. Say Pepsi. Whenever you reach for refreshment, remember... Why take less when Pepsi's best? And now, back to Counter Spy and David Harding in Washington. <laughs> Ferguson. Yes, Mr. Harding. Any word from Peters in Gulfport yet? Not a thing. I'm worried, Mr. Harding. So am I. I'm flying down to Gulfport. I was hoping you'd say that. Call the airport. Tell them to get a plane ready. Then call Merck Kennedy at the field office in Dallas. Tell him to meet me in Gulfport. I'm leaving at once. Wake up, Senor Peters. <clears throat> Wake up, I say. Stop uh, hitting him, you brute. You be silent, Senor Fisher. Or you get it, too. Senor Peter, wake up. Uh, it's morning. You uh, been asleep all night. Johnny sure gave him an awful track on the noggin, Tarl. Yeah, but he's not dead yet. Oh, wake up, you pig of a counter spy. What? what? He's Who, uh, coming, too. What? Take these ropes off my arms and up. You'll do nothing, senor. Except what I tell you. Who are you? I? I am El Toro. El Toro? Oh. You run this gambling ship and the... See? See, the gambling ship and all else you came to find. Amigo, you wish both yourself and the charming Senora Fisher to uh, live, huh? Naturally. Well, then all you need to do is to send a telegram to your, um, uh, how do you say, uh, chief in Washington, the great David Hardy. You say to him, you uh, have investigated, and the headquarters of the sweepstake is not in Gulfport, as you think first. Put in this small town of Veranoche over in Mexico. And you say you go there now. Hey, that's good, Toro. And after I send this wire, taking the heat off you, Mrs. Fisher and I get bumped off, hmm? Oh, oh, oh no, no, amigo. After a short while, you're made free. You think I'm dumb enough to believe that? I know you killed that poor bum Frenchie, and you killed Tom Fisher. <laughs> oh, you grieve me, amigo, to doubt my word. But you listen to me, then. You, I promise nothing. But send the telegram, and the senor will not be harmed. I promise. I wouldn't trust you as far as I could throw the animal you're named after. Very well, then, senor Peters. Observe. Here is my gold-hilted matador sword with which I dispatch the treacherous Frenchie and the reporter. Now, you do as I say, or I kill Senor Fisher here right before your eyes. No! Well, what do you say, Senor? Okay, I'll send the wire. Now ah, you're talking. Bueno, bueno. There's a telegraph pad here on my desk and pen and ink. Now, right. All right. Untie my hands. Now that is simple. With this sword. <clears throat> but try nothing rash, amigo. I know what I'm with. Now let's see. There's not much ink in this ink well. Oh, there's enough for the purpose. Uh, it's enough to blind you for a moment. Oh, I, I'm blind! No, you don't. You throw sink in my eye. You are killing your head out of his the whole two months. Give me that. Bad luck. Toro got away. No use are running out into another trap. Ruth, help me push the desk against the door. I'm trying to. 
figure something out. All right. Here they come. I'll be able to hold them off with Monk's gun for a while. But there's only one bullet left in it. I just had a session with Gulfport Sheriff, Mr. Hardy. Two fellas killed, a Frenchie and Tom Fisher. Two folks disappear, Peters and Mrs. Fisher. But the sheriff has plumb out ideas. Well, we'll have to find Peters and Mrs. Fisher without him then, Kennedy. Did you see the newspaper editor? Cyrus Manning, yes. He's young Fisher's uncle, and he's afraid of something. And I have an idea, but I can't do anything about it until I hear. Maybe that's the call I want now. Hardy speaking. Oh, yes, Mr. King. Have you got that shipping figure? Good, let's have it. Four, four, point, six, seven, tons. Thanks very much. No, no, that's all I need right now. Thanks again. Goodbye. My hunch was right, Kennedy. Now, I've got a plan, but I'll need your help. Now, I'm going back to see Cyrus Manning, editor of the Gulf War Gazette. And I... Now, listen, Mr. Manning. You want your niece, Ruth Fisher, to be found, and you want the killers of your nephew brought to justice, isn't that right? Naturally, Mr. Hardy. Well, then tell me who killed your nephew and who's responsible for your niece's disappearance. I don't know. You're afraid to talk. You're afraid you'll be killed, too, by the golden sword. That's... That's not true. But, Mr. Manning, the men you're protecting can't afford to let you live. You know too much. Your only chance to save your life is to confide in me. Those fellows may be planning to murder you at this very moment. Look out, Mr. Manning. Down on the floor. Somebody shot at you from the window. Come back here. Too bad, Mr. Manning. He got away. Mr. Manning, you all right? Yes. Yes. I think so. Good head. I told you, you were in great danger. Use your head, man. Talk before it's too late. from the door, Toro, or I'll shoot again. I have gotten your chance and your keys. You don't have no bullets left. Now, come on, amigos. We break down the door. Now, together. Did you write, Mr. Peter? Are all the bullets really gone? I can answer it. I found the bluff in and he called my bluff. Oh, dear. Mr. Peter, the door is cracking. I'm afraid it won't be long now. Well, there's the gambling ship, Mr. Hardy. The El Toro. Right, Kennedy. Bring us in alongside, Lieutenant. Yes, sir. Now, Mr. Hardy, aren't you scared there's innocent patrons aboard? No launches have come out here all day, Kennedy. All right, man, check your weapons. Prepare to board. Lieutenant, head us in. Cut your engine. Toro used for printing the phony sweepstakes tickets. Yes. 
Pretty clever setting him up down here in the hole, hmm? Well, you'll never print any more tickets, Peters. That ex-bullfighter is going to the electric chair. By the way, Dave, Kennedy told me about the trick you and he pulled on Manning, the newspaper editor. Firing blank shots near him to make him think Toro was after him, so he talked. Well, fortunately, it worked. How did you happen to suspect that smooth old mint tulip was part of this game? When the Southwest paper mail reported that the Gulfport Gazette bought super newsprint from them, I checked their shipping records against Manning's daily inventory. The inventory was short, which made me suspect that Manning was diverting paper to Toro for his sweepstake tickets. Well, it was all a well-concealed connection, Dave. Yes, Toro was very clever with his gold and sword, but he'll find it won't cut the lock to the death house door. <laughs> friends drop in, be generous, but be thrifty, too. Serve plenty of delicious Pepsi-Cola. Pepsi's big 12-ounce bottle gives you not just one sparkling glass full, but two. Get a carton of six and serve 12 delicious drinks. Yes, Pepsi is America's biggest cola value. You get twice the tangy taste, twice the refreshment, twice the Pepsi. So why take less when Pepsi is best? Whenever you reach for refreshments, remember... Pepsi-Cola, hit the spot, two full glasses, that's a lot. Not for value, not for death. Why take less when Pepsi's best? This is David Harding. A special word to employers. Give work to our handicapped veterans. Next time a job opens, write to Captain Maurice Witherspoon, Masonic Veterans Committee, 71 West 23rd Street, New York City. Give our fighting men a fighting chance for rehabilitation. Tune in every Tuesday and Thursday, same time, same station to Counter Spy. Listen on Thursday for the exciting Counter Spy case of the genuine counterfeit. In the case of the genuine counterfeits, we face a baffling situation of mixed identities. Two men died, yet who were they? One man lived while another hovered between life and death. And a subtle criminal came within minutes of getting away with a long-prepared, carefully rehearsed plot. The decisive clue, a knife in a man's hand. I invite you to be tuned in on Thursday, day after tomorrow, for Case of the Genuine Counterfeit on Counter Spy. Tonight's Counter Spy program originated in New York, was directed by Leonard L. Bass and featured Don McLaughlin and Mandel Kramer, with music by Jesse Crawford. Counter Spy is a Philip H. Lord production for Pepsi Cola. Enjoy some Pepsi, ice cold tonight. PSI, that's your smartest cola buy. That's the cola presents Counter Spy. Washington calling David Harding, Counter Spy. Washington calling David Harding, Counter Spy. Harding, Counter Spy, calling Washington. United States counter spies, especially appointed to investigate and combat the enemies of our country, both at home and abroad. Tonight, the case of a genuine counterfeit. Another counter spy report to the American people. Brought to you each Tuesday and Thursday by Pepsi Cola. Pepsi Cola, it hits the spot. Two full glasses, that's a lot. That's right, you heard what they said. Two full glasses of sparkling Pepsi from one big 12 ounce bottle. You're getting an extra glass full. And what a delicious glass full. The most refreshing, delightful cola that ever tickled your taste. You can't drop Pepsi's tangy flavor. And that big, big bottle saves you money, goes twice as far. Pepsi is America's big, big favorite. And America's biggest cola value. So why take less? When Pepsi is best, whenever you reach for refreshments, remember... Why 
And now to counter spy. A little over six weeks ago, in a small mid European country, a man, the private secretary of a diplomat named Borne, lay on the kitchen floor of his own apartment. His head, twisted to one side, revealed a dark bruise on one temple. And as he lay unconscious, a steady stream of gas hissed from the open jets of the stove. Gas which filled the room and swirled around the flickering pilot light of the stove. Oh, uh, come into the apartment. Thank you. I returned home from the funeral of poor Carlos. You heard of his horrible death and the gas explosion, did you not? Yes, Mr. Bonnie. I heard. Oh, that is it. And right before I am to leave for America. Oh, come on, come on. But let us not speak of that. Uh, tell me, my friend, why are you here? This paper will explain. Huh? You see, I am to replace Carlos as your secretary. You? Giving up your position in the government? But why, why, my friend? Because I am your friend. And I realize your danger. Danger? To me? Mr. Borney, I don't believe the death of your secretary was the accident it seemed to be. Rudolph, you think the gas explosion was... It may have been an attempt to get at you. But why? I'm a poor old man, unimportant. Would your country send you on an important mission like this if they thought that? But that is why they sent me. Since our ambassador in the United States is ill, I sail to America. Arrange for the engraving of bonds for our government and bring them back personally. Oh, merely an honor to an old man. Three million dollars, merely an honor? The engraving of the bond on which the future of our nation depends? Well, perhaps the fact that I avoid publicity and am not known outside our country was an added reason. Oh, I, I think... Thank you. I warn you, Mr. Bond. Don't underestimate your own importance. Or your drink. Uh, your drink was out. Thank you. The death of your secretary. The sudden illness of the ambassador in Washington. I feel it may all be a part of a dangerous point. Of course, yes. Oh, very well, if you're right, I'd better ask the government for an armed guard on my trip. Mr. Borney, I have another suggestion. Uh, what is it, Rudolph? If you know any way... Uh... My suggestion is that you and I exchange identities. That you travel as my secretary, Rudolph, and I as the envoy, Borney. You would take that chance. Yours is the life of value to our country. You must get those bonds through. Mm, very well. You feel that strongly about it, Rudolph? Mm, very well. You shall be the special envoy, Vornay. I shall be your secretary, Rudolph, on our voyage to the United States. under the guise of food. But uh, I did have an interesting dinner partner. Mm -hmm. uh, another gourmet like yourself? No. That American girl. The one we watched come aboard with the invalid in the wheelchair. Ah, yes. The pretty redhead. Mm -hmm. Her name's Myra Stevens. And the man in the wheelchair is her uncle. She's bringing them back to the United States for treatment. Oh, well, you seem to have learned a great deal about her. Oh, that's it. <laughs> if I were 20 years younger, I'd be giving you competition myself. <laughs> well, shall we go to our cabin and finish packing? We dock early. Oh, oh very well, very well. Uh, by the way, uh, we are to be officially met when the ship docks. Uh, officially met? A radiogram came this morning from a Mr. David Harding of the American Counterspy. Counterspy? Yes, he's to meet us personally. 
These agencies may take over the job of guarding me, and you won't have to worry anymore. Please. Please. Oh, Mr. Bullion. Miss Stevens, what's wrong? My uncle. He falls in his wheelchair, and I can't lift him back. Would you and your secretary be willing to help me? Cabin's back down here. He saw you with his medicine when he stopped. Here, this is back here. All right. Now, it's... Uh... Uh, Miss Stevens, uh, Uncle's not on the floor. He's there on the bed. I thought that... Uh... Hello. Good work, Mara. The old fool never knew what hit him. That padded pipe is perfect. Got a mark on it. He can't afford any slips. Not with three million dollars at stake. How about your uncle on the bed? Is he still unconscious? I haven't found out of him since I got him aboard. The stuff you gave him was like a ton. Who is he anyway? Just a sailor I found in the dock. But he served his purpose. Here, give me a hand with old Barney. We'll put him in the wheelchair. Quiet! Well, we get rid of him. What are you saving him for? I have many uses in mind for old Barney. Now, am I right? Does a hypodermic needle bother you? Well, if you don't needle me with it. How long will that stuff keep your men unconscious, you know? Long enough for you to get them ashore tomorrow into your apartment. <laughs> That's a kitten quiet. Now, get me a blanket. Sure. The one I wrapped around the other one. Wrap it around, Barney. Now... As far as anyone knows, this is the same man you brought aboard. Your poor, invalid uncle. Well, you go on posing as warning. Pretty pleasant, though. I planned it tonight. One thing I don't get, though. Everyone in the United States will accept you as warning. Why did you have to forge a duplicate order for those bonds? My dear, Borny was sent out to have three million dollars worth of bonds printed. With that duplicate letter, I can have six million made. Six is more than three. So far, so good. At the right time, I send three million back to my country as they expect. But for myself, I have three million more. Post response, genuine composites, duplicates, that is, to be sold here and there around the world to my own profit. And mine. You'll get your share. Okay, mastermind. How do we get rid of the sailor? We'll wait till the deck is empty. And then send our sailor on his last sail. Without the boat. <laughs> what you're to do. After we toss him over, I call man overboard. Then I tell the captain I saw my secretary, Rudolph, fall over the side of the ship. And I back you up so nobody can doubt your story. Okay, let's get it over. All right. One, two, three. <clears throat> Come on, Uncle. Statistical Department. Please report to Mr. Harding's office at once. Report to Mr. Harding. What's up, Mr. Harding? A job for you, Peter. Oh, I got my bulletproof vest. No, oh, no, this is an easy one. I just want you to meet a ship with me in New York and then arrange for the safety of the foreign envoy who's aboard. Another throneless king? A man named Borne. He's been sent here to arrange the printing of some bonds for his country. Why oh, here, this? To cut the chances of counterfeiting. His country's economy is already shaky, and our issuing these bonds to add to the Marshall Plan aid we're already giving him. Any counterfeits might topple the government. So we play this, man. Well, it's vitally important for the United States to see that his government doesn't fall. These bonds may be the deciding factor. We'll fly up to New York now. The ship docks tomorrow morning. <laughs> I said Mr. Barney went into this restaurant. Huh? Oh, sorry, Dave. That red-headed girl. The one who left the ship with the man in the loose chair? Mm-hmm. Now, if foreign envoys look like that girl, yeah, we'd have even more international complications. Come on, Romeo. <laughs> Mr. said Mr. Barney was wearing a white suit. Over there, Dave. Corner table. He looks rather young, doesn't he? Judging from what I've heard of Barney... Get the down and sit there and inside, didn't 
Uh, Mr. Borne? Ah, you must be Mr. David Hart. Well, I'm sorry we missed you when you came down the gangplank. This is my assistant, Harry Peters. Good morning. Thank you. I'm very pleased to meet you both. Won't you join me? You probably think it odd of me to eat as soon as I land. But you see, I consider myself a gourmet. Food on the boat. I understand. I hope the voyage was good otherwise, though. On the contrary, Mr. Harney. It's a tragic. Oh? My secretary, Rudolph, was lost at sea. Lost? He fell overboard. Evidently an attack of business. Poor oh, Rudolph. Strange we hadn't heard of it, Mr. Harding. Well, death on the high seas, ship of foreign registry, I suppose, Mr. Peters, they would not trouble your counter spies with such a minor, so tragic accident. Oh, is everyone sure it was an accident? It was seen both by myself and another passenger, but there was no question. It was definitely an accident. Was he a close friend, Mr. Boney? Very. Hmm. Well, my business in seeing you this morning, Mr. Borney, was to welcome you to our country and arrange whatever protection you desire while you're here. Protection? Uh, Mr. Harding, I have a great deal to do in your country. A great deal to see. Well, that's right. This is your first time outside your own country, isn't it? Yes. And I'd rather not have your agents traveling after me. I'm sure you understand. That's up to you, of course. If there's anything at all we can do for you, please call on us. Shall we go, Peter? Why the frown, eh? Here's. Did you notice the way Borne was eating? He takes his food seriously. No, I mean the way he handled his silverware. He held a fork in his right hand eating, but when he wanted to cut, he changed the fork to his left. Well, don't we both do the same thing? Of course, we all do in this country. But in the one Borne comes from, a country he's never supposed to have left before. They do it in the opposite way, keeping the fork in the left hand all the time. No, but they... Well, I'll admit it's a small thing, Peter. But there are others, too. Considering the importance of his mission, we can't take any chances. So what could be wrong? I don't know. Yes. But I will. Peter, we're going to have to be awfully careful because of his diplomatic standing. But we're going to do a bit of checking on Mr. Borne. Dave, proof of foul play and Borne's secretary. False fling overboard, is she? Not yet. Someone back is checking that angle now. But I'm checking the recent news reports in Borne's country, and I found that the secretary before this one also died under peculiar circumstances. Oh? Short time before Borne sailed, he died of a mysterious gas explosion at his home. Oh. Well, certainly something very fishy about Borne that isn't explained by his sea voyage. Wait, Dave, there's more. I found that only three pictures of Borne have ever been taken. The only copies of them in the main office of their big news service are mysteriously missing from their files. Peter, this is another proof that we ought to have a better, quicker means of getting photographs of people we're interested in. If we only had some sort of miniature camera that could be issued as standard equipment for every counter spy, it would certainly simplify our work there. Nice uh, question. A camera small enough to fit in the hand with a simplified foolproof mechanism. As simple as the old-style box cameras that a kid could operate. Well, why not send instructions through to Washington tonight? Photo Lab could begin work on it now. I'm going to do it. If we had a camera like that on this case, well, we haven't. We'll do the best we can. Now, first of all, Peter, keep on with this investigation of the high mortality rate in Borney's secretary. Right. Also, I want a tail put on Borney. Our best man, Peter. His name's Trevor. Plant some his hotel, too. I'll see to it, there. And I uh, want all our field officers alerted to try to locate somebody, a relative, a friend, who can identify Borney. They the captain of the ship identified him. At least he's the same man who came aboard. Well, we can't pass up any chances. Now, I also want to know whether Borney has ordered those bonds for his government. If so, I want delivery to install until we complete our investigation. I'll handle that myself. And no, assign J-4 to it. I've got another job for you, Peter. A special job. In just a moment, we'll return to Counter Spy, brought to you by Pepsi-Cola. Pepsi-Cola, Pepsi-Pot, two full glasses, that's a lot. Lots more value, lots more zest. Why take less when Pepsi's best? More and more, among fellows and girls, among mothers and dads, you hear that sane and sensible question. Why take less when Pepsi is best? No budget, no allowance ever had a better friend than tangy, sparkling Pepsi-Cola. Because one big 12-ounce Pepsi bottle gives you two delicious drinks. That's twice as much tangy taste. Twice as much delicious Pepsi to go just twice as far. 
That's why more and more families say, why take less when Pepsi is best? Yes, families like yours and mine, families all over America, they're all saying, why take less when Pepsi is best? Pepsi-Cola, it's a spot, tastes terrific when you're hot, more and better than the rest. Why take less when Pepsi's best? Today, tomorrow, always. Get America's biggest cola value. Take home a carton of six big, big Pepsi bottles. Insist on Pepsi at the store. And say Pepsi at the fountain. Say Pepsi at the stand. Say Pepsi. Whenever you reach for refreshment, remember... Why take less when Pepsi's best? And now, back to Counter Spy. A man stands outside the door of a New York apartment hotel, looks around, then pushes the doorbell. Hello, come here. What's wrong? You told me. Has anything odd happened to you, Myra? Huh? Any repairmen trying to get in? People with the wrong apartment number, noise on the telephone? No, no, nothing. Mm. Think somebody's on it? Think Harding and his counter spies are suspicious. I told you about my lunch. Harding didn't say. He watched me very closely, and now I've been followed every time I leave my hotel. Huh? And you came here? Don't worry, I shook them off. But we must move fast. You mean run away? Give up three million dollars in a year's work? No. I've already ordered the bonds. We just need a little more time. You don't suppose they dealt out you not morning? Myra, darling, suppose I prove that I am. Hmm? Is Bonnie still safe in the next room? Sure. Let's go see. Huh? Tried to wake up, but an hour ago I had to give him another high phone. All right, but from now on only half a shot. Yeah, it's all beef for you. If we cut down on the dose, you might wake up and make a lot of noise. I'm keeping ties and gags, but I'm even conscious enough to find some paper. I want that gold to collect it. Uh... Here, in the drawer, I was keeping it. You mean you were going to steal it? Huh. I give you a chance at part of three million dollars and you waste time on small change. Myra, you're still just a nightclub girl at heart. Hey, now. Hold his arm when I get his fingerprints all over the cigarette case. What good luck do your prints will be on it, too. Oh, no. I quoted my own fingers with collusion. I can't leave any prints. Then what? I read in the paper that David Harvey is again in New York. I'm going to drop in and see him and just happen to leave my case. Warners will be the only prince they'll find them. It's pretty slick, Rudolph, even to you. <laughs> Isn't it? I just hope it's uh, slick enough to fool the compass fire. calling Mr. Harding. A checkup of Bond Engraving Company has revealed that two separate orders have been placed by Bourne. Each order is for $3 million worth of negotiable bond. Examination of the orders proves one letter to be a clever duplicate of the other. Twice the original amount ordered, huh? And that's the answer to his racket. $3 million to be sold by his government in an equal amount for his own profit. Uh, bond companies have agreed to stall him as you requested. Okay. Stand by for further orders. All right, Miss Ferguson, you can send Mr. Vaughn A in now. Come in, Mr. Vaughn A. Thank you. I hope I'm not keeping you from this so important work. Not at all. What can I do for you? I still think to thank you and Mr. Peters for your kindness in meeting me when I shipped up the other day. Oh, I'm sorry Mr. Peters isn't in right now. He's out on a job. Thanks. I hope to see him. Uh, mind if I smoke, Mr. Honey? Well, no. You'll find some cigarettes in there. Oh, please. I got this case. It's my own favorite brand. Oh, do you excuse me? Yes. Howdy, Biggie. Oh, Dr. We got into Borne's room as soon as we left and went over with the infrared equipment so there won't be any traces left. Mm hmm. Get anything? All the fingerprints you want. I bring the photograph right down to be developed. One bad break, though. Borne again shook off the man we had trailing him. No idea where he is now. I have. Here. Boy, if he could hear this call. I don't think that would be too good. I'll see you later. <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Warner. It is my fault for taking up your time when you are busy chasing some, uh, how do you say, international racketeer. No, no, I'm glad you came. I have some news for you. We've located an old friend of yours here in the United States. Uh, 
Really? Otto Sebring in Chicago. He used to work with you in your country. Remember him? Of course. Oh, of course. But you shouldn't have bond. Oh, it's no bother at all, Mr. Bonnet. Anything to make your visit here a memorable one. I've arranged for Sebring to fly in from Chicago tonight. He'll land at 7. <laughs> Someone, please tell me where I can get a cab. Could any? For goodness sake, but no, what happened? Mr. Otto Sebbing. Yes, I'm Otto. Darling, Sebbing. how good to see you. But, but well, I... with me. My name is Myra Stevens. I'm a college star. A college For goodness sake. No time to explain. You value your life to me, I tell you. Darling, just you come along with me. My car is right outside. Why do we have to be so careful? There's no one alive. I told you, you and Vornay are both in danger. You, uh, you are taking me to my old friend, Mr. Vornay, aren't you? Yes, he's been hidden here until we catch the foreign agents. We're after. All right, get inside. All right, you don't have to poke at me, Mr. Vornay. Why do you point that gun at me? Why do people usually point guns, stupid? Go on to the next one. But, but, but you, you said you would take me to my friend. That's just what I'm doing. Get right in here. There you are, Otto, old boy. Mr. Vornick. Well, but, what can you say? He's all tied up in his feet. We tried to convince him he could sign some papers. Maybe now when he sees you, he'll behave. You. You are not a good of fire. Stay where you are. I may wear a fish, Bob, but I can shoot pretty good at close range. No, you, you lied to me. Not entirely. In a way, I am with the cowboy spy. At least my boss, Rudolph, is. Yeah, at this very minute, he's having dinner with David Harding, head of the cowboy spy. Setting up a perfect alibi for himself. <laughs> Mr. Harding, when I invited you to dinner... Well, we'll have our dinner, Mr. Borne, but first I thought you'd like to see how we make an arrest in this country. Of course, but a call I received just before we left was from my agent. They followed the girl accomplice of a certain criminal to a house here in the suburbs. This house, as a matter of fact. Yes. Come on, Mr. Borne. I'm sure you'll be interested. After you, Mr. Honey. Oh, no, Mr. Boyd. After you. Good Wake up. Good Mr. Harding, I... Harding? What kind of thing is it? I took up out of here, like you Harding, said. Fool. That is not possible. That's how we keep that one of Harding's men. A car is fine. I'll take that down. Don't be so... All right, Peter, you've been untied, Mr. Vornay, now. And as for you, Mr. Rudolph, you're under arrest. On what charge, Mr. Harding? The kidnapping of Mr. Vornay, forging official documents, and... But, Mr. Harding, I'm not responsible for what this woman did. Oh, you double-cross jerk. You're not passing the buck to me on this. Mr. Harding, this guy's already killed two men, and before I'm done talking... All right, right. you'll get your chance to talk. You already have all the proof we need. You see, Rudolph, your clever trick with the cigarette case didn't work. We'd already gotten your fingerprints in your apartment. You simply gave away the fact that the real envoy was here, too. (laughs) And you thought you were so slick, Master Mark. He was, but not clever enough. He fell for the story that an old friend of Borney's was coming and led my men here just as we expected. All right, Mr. Harding. Let's get it over with. Let's go. Certainly, Rudolph. Oh, I did promise you a dinner, didn't I? Well, you'll get it. It'll be interesting to get the opinion of a gourmet like yourself, Rudolph, on the food served in our federal prison. <laughs> your friends drop in, be generous, but be thrifty, too. Serve plenty of delicious Pepsi-Cola. Pepsi's big 12-ounce bottle gives you not just one sparkling glass full, but two. Get a carton of six and serve 12 delicious drinks. Yes, Pepsi is America's biggest cola value. You get twice the tangy taste, twice the refreshment, twice the Pepsi. So why take less when Pepsi is best? Whenever you reach for refreshment, remember... 
Pepsi-Cola, hit the spot, two full glasses, that's a lot. Lots more value, lots more zest. Why take less when Pepsi says? Tune in every Tuesday and Thursday, same time, same station, to Counter Spy. Listen next Tuesday for the exciting Counter Spy case of the Society Swindler. Time, said the master criminal, had to be treated just right. And time meant two things, money and death. Yet in the end, it was time that trapped him. For time is not the exclusive weapon of crime, but used, too, by your counter spies. To catch the man I call the Society Swindler. Case of the Society Swindler on Counter Spy. <laughs> Tonight's Counter Spy program originated in New York, was directed by William M. Sweets and featured Don McLaughlin and Mandel Kramer with music by Jesse Crawford. Counter Spy is a Philip H. Lord production for Pepsi Cola. Enjoy some Pepsi, ice cold tonight. <laughs> Cola, P E P S I. That's your smartest cola buy. Pepsi Cola presents Counter Spy. Washington calling David Harding, Counter Spy. Washington calling David Harding, Counter Spy. Harding, counter spy, calling Washington. United States counter spy, especially appointed to investigate and combat the enemies of our country, both at home and abroad. Tonight, the case of the society swindlers. Another counter-spy report to the American people. Brought to you each Tuesday and Thursday by Pepsi-Cola. Pepsi-Cola, hit the spot, two full glasses, that's a lot. That's right, you heard what they said. Two full glasses of sparkling Pepsi from one big 12-ounce bottle. You're getting an extra glass full. And what a delicious glass full. The most refreshing, delightful cola that ever tickled your taste. You can't top Pepsi's tangy flavor. And that big, big bottle saves you money, goes twice as far. Pepsi's America's big, big favorite. And America's biggest cola value. So why take less when Pepsi is best? Whenever you reach for refreshments, remember... Why take less when Pepsi's best? And now, to Counter Spy. <laughs> Twenty-two stories above the streets of Manhattan, in the paneled library of a penthouse, a well-groomed man in a satin smoking jacket sits at a heavy oak desk. His eyes are fixed impatiently on the sweet second hand of his unique alarm wristwatch as a dark-haired woman reads from a list. General and Mrs. Ralph C. Maxton, Dr. and Mrs. Charles Nestor, Commissioner and Mrs. Stephen W. Otis. Oh, by the way, Alfred, Mr. Otis has just been elected chairman of the Board of General Oil. I know all about Otis. Please continue, Carla. Mr. and Mrs. George R. Pace, Ambassador and Mrs. Victor... Ambassador and Mrs. Victor Pagano, Mr. and Mrs. Lance... That'll be all, Carla. But, Alfred, I haven't finished the list. You heard my alarm watch. Time is up. Three and a half minutes. You're a strange man, Alfred. Time is money, Carla. About that list. See to it that the guests appear at Mrs. Grayson's party for the World Refugee Fund. With my name on the invitation as co-hostess, no one will dare refuse to appear. Mm. They're all deadly afraid of what I may write in my weekly column. One unkind word from Countess Carlo Maroni, and they're in hot water. Uh-huh. That title pays you real dividends, doesn't it? Thanks to your cleverness in organizing the World Refugee Fund. Oh, dear sweet charity. What a blessing to mankind. Oh. Mr. Batson. What is it, Zero? Paulson's here. He's 
20 seconds late, zero. Yeah, I know, boss. I kept them out in the hall, like you said. Let's see. It's two minutes to eight. One minute and 30 seconds. That's enough time to give Bolton. Alfred, you'll be back. In one minute and 45 seconds. All right, Joe. You're down the hall. Zero. Did Paulson walk up from the 20th floor as I ordered? Yeah, boss. Everything's set. Good evening, Paulson. Hi, Mr. Babson. You want to see me? Uh, Paulson, you've worked the room best table for me at 11 of our charity parties. You're an excellent group, yeah? And I pay you well. No complaints, Mr. Babson. Uh, then, Paulson, why did you withhold some of the money from your table at last night's party in Philadelphia? I give you exactly... 20 seconds to explain. I... I don't get you. I was watching you, Paulson. You cut yourself a nice slice. Oh, you got me wrong, Zero. I wouldn't do a thing like that to Mr. Babson. You're a liar. Zero. Let him go. Okay, boss. I... I can explain, Mr. Babson. There's no time left to explain. You wasted it lying. Please, just give me a... You heard the boss. Time's up. Get moved. Zero. Open the elevator door for Paulson. With pleasure, That's the way out for you, Paulson. The, the elevator's not there. It's 22 floors below, and you're going down to meet it. What? You're taking a suicide dive, Paulson. That's why I had you get off at the 20th floor and walk the rest of the way up to be sure you wouldn't be traced to my penthouse. All right, Zero. So long, Chisler. Seconds on the nose for Paulson. You timed it just right, Mr. Babson. Of course, Zero. That's the way to treat time exactly right. I hope this party will provide you with plenty of material for your society column. Oh, yes. And the roulette table's just piling up money for the World Refugee Fund. Ah, sweet charity. <laughs> I got your signal, Alfred. Anything wrong? Come into the study, Carla. Have a minute and a half for you. I heard something this afternoon that may mean trouble. Oh? About a man called George Walsh, the cleverest and biggest fake charity organizer on the West Coast. I've just learned that Walsh is headed here to begin operations in East Coast society circles. But, Alfred, we have that big affair at Vera Ashton's home outside Washington next month. Are you afraid of trouble over that? That you can leave to me. More important, Carla... Yes? You are a valuable asset in this business. If Walsh should try to buy you away from me... Don't you trust me? You know about Polson's suicide? The same thing could happen to anyone else who double-crossed me. Ah, my watch tells me our time is up. I have to be going. See you soon, Carla. To David Harding, Chief, United States Counter Spies, Washington. Copy of report from Counter Spy Attaché, Paris. Investigation of the United States Charity Organization, World Refugee Fund, reveals that monies forwarded here from United States are deposited in Paris banks under the name of Jean Lebeau. There is no evidence of monies being used for relief of refugees. I 
beg your pardon, madam. Is there any way I can help you? This is Countess by headquarters, is it not? I wish to see David Harding, and I don't need your help for that, young man. Uh, madam, you shouldn't be in this corridor at all. You'll have to be announced. That's the rule. Rule. <laughs> government by bureaucracy. It wasn't this way when Grover Cleveland piloted our ship of state. Uh, who shall I say is calling? I'll say who's calling when I get in there. Very sorry, madam, but I can't... Young man, remove your hand from my arm or I'll slap your face. Very well. Uh, Ruffian. An organization of ruffians. So, there you are, David Harding. Well, Vera Ashton, for a moment I thought a tornado hit the building. We have an appointment, I think, David. Vera, you haven't changed a bit. Now sit down and cool off that temper of yours. David, I have a good mind to send a letter to the president about the way you run this office, and I would, <laughs> if I didn't love you so much. <laughs> you're a sweetheart. Oh, you're not fooling me with that sugar talk, David. Why did you ask me to come and see you? Vera... I see by the columns that you're giving a charity party next week out at your place in Chevy Chase. It'll make every other affair this season look sick. Countess Carla Maroney is my co-hostess. And the proceeds are to go to the World Refugee Fund. Now, Vera, as a favor to me, I want you to switch your sponsorship to another charity instead of World Refugee. Davis, are you mad why Countess Maroney is making all arrangements? Her name on the invitation is a guarantee of success. My agents, Vera, have been investigating all organizations sending money overseas for relief. Most of them are worthy groups, but we've uncovered a few exceptions. The World Refugee Fund is one of them. Ridiculous. Here's a cable report from our attaché in Paris. The World Refugee Fund is a phony front for a charity racket. Countess Maroney should be told about this. Our records show that every charity party sponsored for a world refugee was arranged by her. You mean she... Then she should be arrested. Oh, no, no. Just now, she's of much more value to us on the loose. Now, I'm interested in getting at the big brains behind this sleazy racket. And I've already started a trick to smoke him out. Do you want to help? David Hardy, that's the silliest question you ever asked. Then I'll let you in on a secret. A big West Coast charity racketeer, George Walsh, is coming east to operate in society circles. His assistant, a fellow named Ralph Harrison, will be with him. And he's going to call on you, Vera. Good heavens. Oh, David, is this another of your techniques? <laughs> Still can't fool you, can I? But seriously, Vera, I hope to trap that unknown racketeer behind Countess Maroney. And there's nothing like the assumed threat of gangland claim jumping to bring an unknown criminal out into the light. But, David, what has a fight between criminals to do with me? Vera, I'm making your charity party next week the battleground. <laughs> Mr. Harding, I found this memo from you on my desk. Oh, yes, Peter. Mr. Ralph Harrison has a five o'clock appointment tomorrow in the solarium of Mrs. Vera Ashton's home. What's it supposed to mean? Just what it says. You will keep that appointment as scheduled, Mr. Harrison. And now, Mr. Harrison, allow me to present you to my dear friend, Countess Carla Maroney. Countess? How do you do? Carla, darling, as I told you on the phone, Mr. Harrison is assistant director of the Federation of European Charities. Uh, do sit down, both of you. Thank you. Some tea, Carla. I can only stay a moment, Mrs. Ashton. You said you wanted to discuss something with me about our party here on Friday. Yes, I, uh, uh, well, you see, Carla, darling, Mr. Harrison's been showing me amazing figures of the work of his organization in the rehabilitation of war orphans. And he has convinced me that the proceeds of our party should go to his group instead of... Mrs. Ashton, our party was arranged for the World Refugee Fund. Besides, the invitations are all out with my name on them. Well, I'm sure the Countess won't mind lending her name to another worthy cause. I certainly do mind. Mrs. Ashton, unless you go through with our original plan, I'll have a great deal to say about it in my newspaper column. Good afternoon. Just a minute, Countess. 
May I use your car? Excuse us, Mrs. Ashton? Certainly. This way, Connor. Countess, I want to talk to you about George Walsh. Walsh? Mm Mm-hmm. He likes the way you work the angles. He's my boss. And he's ready to offer you double the percentage you get now. I don't know what you're talking about. Countess, we know you're in the racket. Racket? What impudence? I'm at the Crescent Hotel, Countess. You can call me when you decide to accept Mr. Walsh's offer. Hello, Mr. Harding Peters. How'd you make out, Peters? So far, so good. Then don't come back at headquarters. Meet me in half an hour at Pennsylvania and 18th. Okay? Okay, Dave. Hello? Hello? Last. When did you get into Washington? About 20 minutes ago with Zero and the other boys. I'm stopping at the Hotel Newton. I've got to see you at once. What's wrong? That trouble you anticipated. It's here, in Washington. Hey, mister. Is that light? Yeah, here you are. Car in the corner, Peters. Mr. Harden's waiting for you. field office just come up with some interesting information. It may be the tie-in we're looking for. Shoot. Three weeks ago, a man named Steve Polson was killed when he fell or jumped down an apartment house elevator shaft. It turns out that Polson was a croupier at the charity parties for the World Refugee Fund. Any evidence of murder? No, but the penthouse of that apartment building is leased by an Alfred C. Babson. Any dope on him there? No, Babson's a society playboy, and a checkup shows he's been an invited guest to all the parties. And he's right here in Washington. Arrived less than an hour ago. Harding, car one, go ahead. J-12 reporting, Mr. Harding. Countess Moroni just went into room 907 at the Hotel Newton. Register shows room occupied by Alfred C. Babson. Thanks. Peters. Get back to your room at the Crescent. Now, if Countess Maroney's with Batson now, I think you can expect a phone call from her very shortly. I'll be most interested to know her proposition. In just a moment, we'll return to Counter Spy, brought to you by Pepsi Cola. Pepsi-Cola, hit the spot, two full glasses, that's a lot. Lot more value, lot more zest. Why take less when Pepsi's best? More and more, among fellows and girls, among mothers and dads, you hear that sane and sensible question, why take less when Pepsi is best? No budget, no allowance, ever had a better friend than tangy, sparkling Pepsi-Cola. Because one big 12-ounce Pepsi bottle gives you two delicious drinks. That's twice as much tangy taste. Twice as much delicious Pepsi to go just twice as far. That's why more and more families say, why take less when Pepsi is best? Yes, families like yours and mine. Families all over America. They're all saying, why take less when Pepsi is best? Pepsi-Cola hits the spot. Tastes terrific when you're hot. More and better than the rest. Why take less when Pepsi is best? Today, tomorrow, always. Get America's biggest cola value. Take home a carton of six big, big Pepsi bottles. Insist on Pepsi at the store. And say Pepsi at the fountain. Say Pepsi at the stand. Say Pepsi. Whenever you reach for refreshment, remember... Why take less when Pepsi's best? And now, back to Counter Spy. In a Washington hotel room, charity racketeer Alfred Babson and Countess Carla Maroney are discussing George Walsh's offer. See, Carla, Walsh's offer is double whatever I'm giving you. Alfred, I told you I can be trusted. Boss, we better pull out of this caper. Yes, dear. 
Why? Well, we heard Walsh is a tough customer with a mob of gorillas. Maybe. But I'm not letting this plum fall off of my hands into his lap. Carla, the first step is for you to call this man Harrison and arrange a meeting right away. You take him for a drive across the river. Why park here, Countess? I want to talk to you alone, Mr. Harrison, about the offer you made me on behalf of Mr. Walsh. You ready to switch over to the smart money? I've been thinking about it seriously. Can I tell Mr. Walsh it's all set? Yeah, you can tell Walsh it's all set. Hello, stranger. Okay, Carter, go take a walk. Yes. All right, Zero. Nice dame, the Countess. Look, Harrison, my boss has a proposition for your Mr. Walsh. And what's the gun for? Just to make sure you listen. And my boss figures there's plenty for two outfits in this territory. If your Mr. Walsh wants to play nice, okay. If he don't, then there's a lot of shooting. And, and that means the law. And none of us makes sense. And it's a deal? I'll have to talk to Mr. Walsh. What's his cut? He and my boys can talk that over. Where and when? You bring Walsh to the Ashton Dame's big party tomorrow night. My boss will be out on the terrace. There'll be a white carnation in his buttonhole so you can spot him. A white carnation? You two show out on the terrace at 11, on the nose. Do you think Walsh will go for a setup like that? Mrs. Ashton's party at 11. Chief meets your boss. Yeah. Yeah, Zero. I guarantee you my boss will go for a setup like that. All right, Zero, get going. What took you two so long? Boy, I told you on the phone, I closed the deal with Harrison, and I took him to where he could get a cab back to Washington. And Zero had to pick me up again. After all, this is my car. Very well. You keep driving around a while, Zero. This is the safest place to talk. Has something new gone wrong, Alfred? No, but I'm sure Walsh will try everything to put me out of the way. But this time, Carla, he's meeting his master. No, Alfred. No more murders. I... I want to get out of this. Carla, there's only one way out of this for you. The way Paulson took. Now, Zero, about the plan. This is to be timed to the split second. At Mrs. Ashton's house, there's a set of French windows which lead from the drawing room out to the terrace. Carla, at exactly four minutes before 11... You will go into the drawing room and switch on the lights. Yes. I want Walsh and Harrison silhouetted plainly against those French windows. I see. There's a row of bushes at the rear of the garden a hundred yards from the terrace. I'll jockey Walsh and Harrison into position in front of the window. At 11.01, I light a cigarette. Zero, that will let you know you have exactly two minutes... To get ready. I'll be ready. At 11.03, my alarm will go off. You won't hear it, Zero, so keep your eyes on your own watch. At 11.03, you fire with the telescopic sight. One shot for watch, one for Harrison. And remember, both of you, timing is everything. Dave, I've got something that could have helped us on this case. And what is it? Well, I took out specifications for a miniature camera to one of the best manufacturers in the country. Told him the camera was to be used as standard equipment for all counter spies. Their production engineer gulped a couple of times and put our camera on a priority basis. Yeah. Well, here's a dummy model. Hey, Peters. 
He certainly is a honey. Mm-hmm. Simple to operate, sturdily built, and films can be bought anywhere. The manufacturer really did himself proud. He's even going to use a faster lens, for one thing, and the camera will be lighter in weight. Oh. When can we get these in quality? I'll phone him you're okay. He'll start deliveries right away. Do it. It's too bad we couldn't use one of these cameras tonight on this Babson case, Chief. It'll be just the thing. Yep. I'm sorry, Peter. But make your phone call and let's go. We've got a bit of a ride out to Mrs. Ashton's house in Chevy Chase. Most important. David, I'm worth any ten of your agents. I'll keep that miserable countess creature away from the terrace, all right. I'll talk her deaf, dumb, and blind. Vera, I love you. Well, I'd better get started. Come on, Peter. Go on the terrace. Right. Down there by the French windows, Dave. That must be our man. Oh, white carnation in his look, though. Uh, pardon me. No? You have the time? Oh, yes. Yeah. Just 11. We're on the nose. As Zero said you wanted it. You have some? That's right. This is my boss, George Walsh. Walsh? This is a pleasure. My name's Alfred Babson. Babson, the pleasure's all mine. She's been looking forward to this meeting, Mr. Benson. Yes. And now, Babson, I'm sure I'm going to get just what I came for. Walt, haven't I seen you someplace before? I've been seen a lot of places before. Hmm. Cigarette ball? No, thank you. Allison? Thanks. Lion? Mm-hmm. Well, Walsh, we'll have everything settled in less than two minutes. We both know what we want, and I'm a stickler for time. I noticed that wristwatch of yours, that's mm-hmm. an alarm on it. Nice gadget. No, thank you. I had it made especially. Now, Walsh, let's hear your plan. Okay, Babson. Here's my plan. Oh, oh. Don't try to get out of it, Babson. Oh, no. The more you struggle, the more it'll hurt. Oh. That's a hammer hold that she's got on you, Babson. <clears throat> Keep it up and you'll have a broken arm. Oh. Oh. That's better. What's that here, this caper? Go on, Babson, over to the French window. Oh, wait. Move, what? I said. But, Frenchman, we can't stand here. No? Somebody will see us. We, we'd better go inside. We'll talk right here, and you've got only 60 seconds left. Hmm? 60, Babson, only 60. You're right in front of me, Babson. When Zero shoots from those bushes down there, you get it first. Well, you know... After the Countess made the appointment to meet my assistant, I had her car wired for sound. What I heard you, Zero, and the Countess say sounded very interesting. Babson, 45 seconds left. Huh? I'll be killed. Sound out to shoot. 40 seconds, Babson. Now you're getting just what you gave Steve Poulsen. Ah, I had killed Poulsen... I, I I couldn't trust him. Thirty-five seconds left. Don't let Zero shoot. Stop him. Walsh, I'll give you anything you want. Sounds as if you have an offer for me. Twenty-five seconds, Batson. Walsh, I'll clear out of the charity racket. You take over the whole operation. Everything. The Countess goes with it. You can have it all. Fifteen seconds to go. Didn't you hear me? I'm giving you everything. Ten. It, no! Don't shoot! It's me! Don't shoot! Now exactly three minutes past eleven. It's me! No! Don't shoot! Don't shoot! Don't! 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 I wasn't shot. No. But that shot... 
fired by one of my men as a signal to let me know that everything down there was under control. But zero. We got zero. And with your confession, Babson, the government closes this case. Government? Babson, while your mouth is open in that stupid gate, keep it that way. Mr. George Walsh here is David Harding, chief of the counterspies. That's right, Babson, and I can guarantee you personally, when the time arrives for your trial, the jury isn't going to show you any charity. When your friends drop in, be generous, but be thrifty, too. Serve plenty of delicious Pepsi-Cola. Pepsi's big 12-ounce bottle gives you not just one sparkling glass full, but two. Get a carton of six and serve 12 delicious drinks. Yes, Pepsi is America's biggest cola value. You get twice the tangy taste, twice the refreshment, twice the Pepsi. So why take less when Pepsi is best? Whenever you reach for refreshment, remember... Pepsi-Cola, hit the spot, two full glasses, that's a lot. Lot more value, lot more debt. Why take less when Pepsi's best? Tune in every Tuesday and Thursday, same time, same station, to Counter Spy. Listen on Thursday for the exciting Counter Spy case of the high-class hijacker. Bottle of chloroform, drops of green oil, and eyes without a body, the result is unpredictable. Add these ingredients to a clever and dangerous underworld operation, and the result is action. That's our case for next Thursday, day after tomorrow. I invite you to be listening for Case of a High Class Hijacker on Counter Spy. <laughs> Tonight's Counter Spy program originated in New York, was directed by Leonard L. Bass, dramatized by Edward J. Adamson, and featured Don McLaughlin and Mandel Kramer, with music by Jesse Crawford. Counter Spy is a Phillips H. Lord production for Pepsi Cola. Enjoy some Pepsi, ice cold tonight. <laughs> Pepsi-Cola, P-E-P-S-I, that's your smartest cola buy. Pepsi-Cola presents Counter Spy. Washington calling David Harding, Counter Spy. Washington calling David Harding, Counter Spy. Harding, Counter Spy. Calling Washington. United States counter spies, especially appointed to investigate and combat the enemies of our country, both at home and abroad. Tonight, the case of a high class hijacker. Another counter spy report to the American people. Brought to you each Tuesday and Thursday by Pepsi-Cola. Pepsi-Cola, hit the spot, two full glasses, that's a lot. That's right, you heard what they said. Two full glasses of sparkling Pepsi from one big 12-ounce bottle. You're getting an extra glass full. And what a delicious glass full. The most refreshing, delightful cola that ever tickled your taste. You can't top Pepsi's tangy flavor. And that big, big bottle saves you money, goes twice as far. Pepsi is America's big, big favorite. And America's biggest cola value. So why take less when Pepsi is best? Whenever you reach for refreshment, remember. Why take less when Pepsi is best? And now, to Counter Spy. It is approaching midnight. On a dirt road, at right angles to a paved, steeply graded highway in Tennessee... A dark blue sedan is parked. Two men sit in the front seat, waiting. Suddenly, the silence of the night is broken by the roar of a trailer truck climbing the steep highway. The thin man in the sedan flicks away his cigarette. Okay, Fatso, let's go. What's the idea, you guys? Hijackers. That's right. Keep your hands on the wheel and sit tight. Corny, you know I ain't that fast. 
Two of you, huh? Yeah, my pal's kind of slow on his feet. Always running, always running. Get the complaints, pal. Okay, driver, outside and climb down. What are you going to do with me? Turn around, Junior. Yeah, but... Turn around. Okay, Pretzel. <coughs> Did that neat, didn't I, Corny? Drag him to the side of the road. Always I get the heavy work. Good for you, Fatso. Helps you reduce. Well, we can take these masks off now. He's in dreamland. Oh, glad to get it off. Suffocator guy. Fatso, you take the car. I'll follow in the truck. Oh, Corny, let me take the truck. It's a long walk to the car, all uphill. All of 50 feet. Scram, Fatso. Start walking. Oh, always I got to walk on. I'll get Joyce and we'll finish the paperwork. Right. Joyce? Oh, Joyce? Yes, Mr. Midland? I'm sorry, but uh, a little business has come up. Right away, Mr. Midland. You see, folks, that's what happens to a secretary when she attends the boss's party. It won't take long, Joyce, in the library. Yes, Mr. Midland. Hello, Joyce. Hello, Corny. I'll get my notebook, Mr. Midland. Uh, yes. A good uh, haul, Corny? Yeah, sure. Soap, detergents, toothpaste, candy, regular items. I had Fatso make up a list. Let me have it, Corny. I'll copy it. Joyce, uh, check off any items that we don't buy from regular sources. We'll make our purchase orders tomorrow at the office. Right. Now, Corny, I'm opening up two new drugstores in our chain next week. Two? We'll make a total of 14 stores. We're getting big. That means we've got to knock off more trucks to keep up with the demand in our stores. Okay by me, Mr. Midland. The more trucks I knock off, the more dough I get. That's right. Now... Oh, for it. What's the matter, Joyce? Oh, Fatso's handwriting. I can't read it. Well, just try. It's no use. I'll have to go out to the hideout myself and check this load. All right. I'll uh, drive you out. Tomorrow will do. But from here on in, Mr. Midland, I think we should check these trucks ourselves. Always the efficient secretary, eh, Joyce? I believe in doing a thing right. Then we'll do it right. Corny, on the next load, we'll be out there to check. Uh, what is the next load? A uh, tobacco shipment via the Valley Trucking Company two nights from now. You and Fatso knock it off, and then Joyce and I will uh, check it off. Attention, Counter Spy Headquarters, Washington, from Counter Spy Field Office, Central City. Valley Trucking Company, Interstate Concern, reports hijacking of $40,000 tobacco load. This is the second interstate hijacking out of 14 all told in this area during the last month. Local police urge Counter Spy intervention in this case. <laughs> Haley, this is Harding. What's the situation on those new mini-cameras? They're coming in fast, Mr. Harding, and they're beauties. Small, compact, and they turn out crystal clear prints and enlargements. Wonderful. Well, get up here with one of those cameras right away. We've got a headache. We may be able to use them on. Statistical Department, Harding speaking. Send the modus operandi files on all hijacking for the last two years to my office as soon as you can. 
chemical division. This is Harding. Our data on black light and fluorescent pigments. Get it all together and bring it into my office. I'm going to have a problem for you technicians to solve. Miss Trumbull, where's Peters? I've been buzzing his private office. No answer. Well, he went down to barber shop, Mr. Harding. I can get him for you. Good. Tell him I want to see him right away. Hello, Chief. What's up? Why the rush? Sit down, Peters. We're going to work on those hijackings in the Midwest. Huh? They knocked off a second truck interstate, so we're assuming jurisdiction now instead of just advising the local authorities. Good. Those records you got on your desk from the modus operandi file? Yes. Now, all told, there are 14 hijackings that fit the same pattern. Hijackers masked, trucks stopped on hills where they can't pick up speed, drivers slugged. All in the same general area. Well, more or less, they've been concentrated in these three Midwest states. Trailer trucks. Ten of them with built-in alarm systems. Going to be tough to crack? Well, maybe. Maybe not. Now, I've got two jobs for you right away. Shoot. Well, first, you... What's the matter there? What's the matter with you? Me? Well, there's something... You look lopsided. What's the matter with your hair? Oh, oh that. Well, you wanted me to come up here right away. I was in the middle of a haircut. Well, it didn't have to be that right away. <laughs> okay, Dave. Now, first, get down to the photo lab. Haley's got that slick new mini camera down there. He'll explain the operation to you. Jack. And go see the companies that make these truck alarm systems. We want to attach cameras to their alarms. we Will do. Now, next. See Carl Palmer in the materials division. He's compiling a list of patent medicines and drugs that were hijacked. Right. Now, you make contact with the manufacturers of those products. You see, they're required to keep a chemical analysis of each batch of their product as manufactured. You want me to get the analysis of the hijacked batch if I can? That's right. Report to me when you've obtained results. Here, or would you be on your way to the Midwest? Well, here, most likely, Dr. Boswell in the chemical lab is trying to turn out a permanent type of breadcrumb for us. Hmm? The Hansel and Gretel fairy story, remember? A trail of breadcrumbs? We're going to see if we can get the hijackers to leave us the same kind of trail. I don't get it. Well, but... you don't have to at the moment. Just get started on that stuff I gave you. Right away, Dave. Well, not too right away. Take ten minutes to finish that haircut. Then get going. <laughs> Cornelius. Oh, Mr. Bedlam. You come to check the load yourself, like you said, huh? Yes. Everything go all right? Yeah, Mr. Bedlam. That's I'll tell you. Just double checking. Pull the truck over to the empty van. We'll unload this one right away. Okay. Joyce. Right. We'll uh, check this stuff. It all goes to our Central City warehouse. Make out the bill of lading accordingly. Yes, Mr. Midland. Hiya, Joyce. Hello, Carney. Now, where's that big... Uh... I saw probably fell asleep in the car. No, no, I didn't. Not me. A long walk from the driveway. Always a long walk. Hello, Mr. Midland. Hello, Fatso. We brought three men to help with the unloading. They're playing cards in the old farmhouse. I'll open the truck and put them to work, Mr. Midland. You son yourself, that's all good for that front porch of yours. Now don't you worry about my front porch, Corny. I'll take care of it. Always I do the work. Oh. Always he complains. Always. Corny, in the next few days, I want you to put on four more men. We're expanding our operations. They'll work in the northern part of the state around Norport. Four more, Mr. Midland? Yes. I want to buy as little as possible from legitimate wholesalers. Getting our product this way is much more profitable. Okay. I'll dig up some real good boys. Now, Joyce, you'd better... What's that? Holy mackerel. That fool, he's broken the auto alarm system. Come on! What happened? What did I do? You fat moron. Joyce, the keys, have you got them? Here, Mr. Midland. The alarm box. They're on the side of the truck. Yes, I see it. That's so you subhuman idiot. Oh, your brains are on your stomach. No, I didn't do nothing. Just broke open the lock. Didn't you see the shield on the tailgate? Get closer so that you can read it. Oh, Mr. Oh. Midland, easy on him. Please. I ought to kill him. Easy, Mr. Midland. Hey, Muttonhead, read what it says on the shield. Huh? This truck protected by CKY auto alarm. The alarm system is not under the control of the driver. 
Well, what's it mean? It means that we're lucky I had the foresight to anticipate this. If I hadn't picked a hideout here in the hills, half the cops in creation would have been down on us by now. Always it's my fault, always. I'm sorry. Only nobody told me. What have you got a brain for? You can read, you prove that. Okay, so I did wrong. Well, how come you can shut it off, Mr. Midland, when it says not even a driver can? Because I have keys to the alarm system. Here, Corny, you take them. Three keys. One for each alarm system used on trucks in this area. Okay, Mr. Middle. Have duplicates made for the new men that you hire. I want things set up so that we're knocking off the truck a day. Back to Counter Spy in just a moment. But first... Pepsi-Cola, hit the spot, two full glasses, that's a lot. Lot more value, lot more zest, buy cake less when Pepsi's best. More and more, among fellows and girls, among mothers and dads, you hear that sane and sensible question, why take less when Pepsi's best? No budget, no allowance, ever had a better friend than tangy, sparkling Pepsi-Cola. Because one big 12-ounce Pepsi bottle gives you two delicious drinks. That's twice as much tangy taste. Twice as much delicious Pepsi to go just twice as far. That's why more and more families say, why take less when Pepsi is best? Yes, families like yours and mine. Families all over America, they're all saying, why take less when Pepsi is best? Pepsi Cola, hits the spot, tastes terrific when you're hot. More and better than the rest. Why take less when Pepsi is best? Today, tomorrow, always. Get America's biggest cola value. Take home a carton of six big, big Pepsi bottles. Insist on Pepsi at the store. And say Pepsi at the fountain. Say Pepsi at the stand. Say Pepsi. Whenever you reach for refreshment, remember. Why take less when Pepsi best? Now back to Counter Spy. <laughs> Following David Harding's instructions, Harry Peters is calling on a leading manufacturer of automatic alarm systems. Well, Mr. Denton, your auto alarms are certainly loud enough. Oh, yes, Mr. Peters. That's why I think the hijackers drive these trucks to some backwoods section and break them open. Our sirens can be heard a couple of miles away once they're tampered with. Well, the hijackers might have a key to your alarm system. Well, that's a possibility. A good one, too. That's why we want these mini cameras installed on the truck separate from your system. Yes, sir. Three of them in each truck. Now, our photo lab has worked out a way to do it. When the truck doors are open, each camera will take a picture. That way, we'll get three actual photos of the truck breaking in. Well, we'll be glad to be Peter. Pretty soon, these cameras will be standard equipment for all counter spies. But right now, we'll just want them installed in whatever trucks in that Midwest area use your alarms. I see. Well, that's about 40 or 50. But there are other companies in this general area with similar systems. Yes, I know. I'm going to contact them, too. Good, good. Now, Mr. Danton, when your mechanics install these cameras, please tell them only this. Yes? They're just an additional feature of your regular alarm system. Oh, naturally. Mighty nice-looking job, these cameras. My boy would love to have one for himself. Well, later on, Mr. Harding told me he wants them to be available to everyone. I'll let you know. Meantime, be cautious about it. We'll be discreet, Mr. Peter. Good. And let's hope the counter spies will be successful. Goodbye, Mr. Denton. And, Mr. Frost, you do have a chemical analysis of the lot of your cough remedy that was hijacked. Better than that, Mr. Peter. We keep a spectroscope card of every lot. Color breakdown? That's right, Mr. Peter. We take a sample of every batch we make, then we throw a light on it, project it to a prism that breaks it down into its component colors, and photograph those colors for our records. We want to make copies of that color card, Mr. Frost. You're welcome to. If you can match it exactly with a sample, that sample will be from the lot that was stolen. That's what we hope to do, Mr. Frost. Thank you. Harding, uh, wait till I turn this off. 
How's it coming, Dr. Bob? Well, as you see, I've been working with this standard truck engine mounted on blocks. Mr. Harding, the problem's lit. Good. Show me. Well, here's the oil. I've impregnated it with a green fluorescent pigment. But it looks like ordinary oil. Well, look at it under our black light lamp. Well, <laughs> a nice, bright green dot. Yes, you equip our patrol cars with a black light headlamp, and it'll pick up this spot on a road at 40 feet. Well, now, have you worked out a way of dropping the oil for yes, a trail? Yes, sir. You see, just back of the oil crankcase, this can? Yes, I see. Well, it has a hole in it and a shutter arrangement like a camera. The shutter is driven by a small electric motor and continually revolves inside the can. Mm -hmm. Now, this switch here, which can be fastened to the truck dashboard, controls the outlet in the can. The moment the driver switches it on, oil starts dripping. Good. Good enough. Might as well have a hundred of these made up right away, will you? All right, sir. Mr. Harding, Mr. Peters is on the phone. Mr. Harding, Mr. Peters is on uh, the phone. Excuse me, Doctor. Mrs. Harding, put Mr. Peters on this line, please. Peters? Yes, sir. How's it going? Okay. I've arranged for the installation of the campus, and I've got a color card on Dobbs Cough Remedy, one of the hijacked items. Oh, that's better than I expected. We'll have copies of it made and forwarded to all our field offices in those Midwestern states. I've already done that, Chief. Good. Also... Send a TWX to our field offices. Have them buy samples of the remedy from every retail outlet in their area. Right. Then they're to make color cards of the samples to check with the card on the stolen lot. Will do. You meet me in Central City. We'll work out of our field office there, since it's the biggest city in the area. Good morning, Central City Field Office. Forwarded from Washington. Spectroscope analysis Dobbs cough remedy reveals Midland Drug Store's only outlet handling the stolen batch here in Danville. We'll continue reports. There it is again, Dave. Midland Drug Company. Nine times in two weeks. And not another company in this whole area has had a single bottle of that batch of cough remedy. Peter, call Joe Lincoln in our tax department. We'll set up some excuse to examine the Midland Drug Company's books. Okay, uh... Wait a minute, hold it. Thomas by field office, Harding speaking. Oh? Three quarters of an hour overdue. You have a map of the route he was taking? Good. I'll be over at your office. I'll pick it up in ten minutes. Goodbye. Hi, Jacking Dave. That was the traffic manager of the Valley Trucking Company. One of their trucks is three quarters of an hour overdue in Danville. I'll get out a police alarm on it right away. Well, now, if the truck's located, tell him to call us in patrol car number 23. Right. That's equipped with a black light headlamp. Now, we'll follow the truck's route, and I hope the driver had time enough and sense enough to turn on that oil switch. See anything yet, Peter? No, not yet, Dave. How far have we come? About 35 miles from the city. Well, hey, that hill up ahead. Yeah, look, Peter. A pool of green on the road up ahead. I see it. This is it. The hijackers must have let the motor idle after the driver turned on the oil switch. Search the side of the road. See if we can find the driver. Right. Dave. Dave, here he is. I'm cold. Is he all right? I felt his pulse. Just unconscious. I'll radio the state police to pick him up right away. Then we'll pick up the trail of these oil drops and hope they lead to a real pickup. <laughs> Not too fast, Peters. We followed the trail about 15 miles. They must be turning off the road pretty soon. All right, Chief. I'll... Wait, hold it. Stop. What is it? No more oil spots on the highway. We passed a dirt road on our right just a few yards back. Back up. They must have turned in there. Getting worse, Dave. We may be getting close. Better stop the car, Peter. I'll take the black light hand lamp and go ahead on foot. Now I'll wave you ahead as long as I can follow the trail of oil drops. Hey, Peter. The fluorescent oil spots end right. 
right at that barn. Then they doubled back where they drove the truck out again. A wonderful hideout. An abandoned farm really in the backwoods. There's a light in only one room in the old farmhouse. Well, gun's ready, Peter. We may need it. Keep holding it. Who are you guys? United States counter spies. Huh? You're under arrest for hijacking. Con- counter spies? How'd you find this place? We might tell you if you tell us some of the things we want to know. I don't do no talking. Maybe not here. Well, a ride may loosen your tongue. Get going. Well, now, now, look, look. Let me get rid of this apron, huh? I look awful silly being arrested in an apron. Okay, put down that dish. Get your jacket on. That's one dish you won't have to clean. There's a lot of dishes to clean in prison. And you could use the exercise. Always cracks about my front porch. Even the cops even. Get the lamentation. Start moving. You've got a lot of questions to answer. All right now, Fatso. Car radio, Chief. I'll take it, Peters. Keep driving. Garland, counter-strike car 23, Mr. Harding. Garland, counter-strike car 23, Mr. Harding. Harding speaking, Haley. Go ahead. Hey, Mr. Valley transportation truck that was hijacked. The local police found it abandoned here in Milton, a suburb of Central City. Nice going, Haley. The cameras, have you checked them? Yes, sir. I brought a portable developing outfit along when we got the flash about the truck. What results? Plenty. There are seven people in the photos. Three men unloading the truck. A girl checking the load. Uh, uh, a human blimp eating a candy bar, and two other men. Any identification? You haven't heard it all, Mr. Harding. The local police have checked the miniature photos, and they swear that one of the men is Mr. Midland. Midland? Head of the Midland Drug Company. Okay, Haley. Get a squad of men together and head for the Midland Drug Warehouse in Central City. Okay, Mr. Harding. We'll meet you there. Just keep it under observation. Don't move until we arrive. Right, sir. Step on it, Peter. I'll have a little chat with Fatso back here. After what he's heard, I'm sure he feels a lot more like talking. Don't you, Fatso? Well, that checks, Mr. Nippon. The last of the load's been put away in the warehouse. Any items that we don't order through our regular channel? Nope. All standard product. How much was the load worth, Joyce? Approximately ten thousand dollars, Corny. Five percent of that is five hundred bucks. Not bad for a night's work, eh, Cornelius? Yeah, I'm happy, Mister Midland. Good. As we get bigger, there'll be more money in it for you. I hope so. Put out the warehouse lights, Joyce. We may as well leave. Right, Mister Midland. We uh, all leave together, Mister Midland. Why not? Just an industrious boss and his equally industrious employees working overtime. All right, Mister Midland. All lights out. Let's go. Hello, Mr. Midland. What? I'm sorry, I don't know me. You will, Mr. Midland, you will. I'd like you and your companions to come with me. Who do you think you are, guy? His name is David Harding. Harding? Harder spies. Oh, my. I don't understand. It's no but... use, Midland. We've got the whole picture of your hijacking set up. In nice, clear pictures. Oh, no. Hey, Corny, get, get him, Peter. All right, Dave, I've got him. But I don't understand. I, I I had it all figured. My setup, my big organization. There's one thing you didn't figure, Midland. The counter spies have a bigger organization. Okay, Peters, let's take them along. When your friends drop in, be generous, but be thrifty too. Serve plenty of delicious Pepsi Cola. Pepsi's big 12-ounce bottle gives you not just one sparkling glassful, but two. 
Get a carton of six and serve 12 delicious drinks. Yes, Pepsi is America's biggest cola value. You get twice the tangy taste, twice the refreshment, twice the Pepsi. So why take less when Pepsi is best? Whenever you reach for refreshment, remember... Pepsi Cola, it's the spot. Two full glasses, that's a lot. Lots more value, lots more zest. Why take less when Pepsi's best? Tune in every Tuesday and Thursday, same time, same station, to Counter Spy. Listen next Tuesday for the exciting Counter Spy case of the photographed furrier. When international complications were threatened because of stolen furs, your Counter Spies had to use a camera and a special cameraman. How this setup ran into an unusual obstacle that spelled murder will be exposed next Tuesday. Be sure to be tuned in for Case of the Photographed Furrier on Counter Spy. Tonight's Counter Spy program originated in New York, was directed by Mark B. Loeb, dramatized by Palmer Thompson, and featured Don McLaughlin and Mandel Kramer with music by Jesse Crawford. Bob Shepard speaking. Counter Spy is a Philip H. Lord production for Pepsi-Cola. Enjoy some Pepsi, ice cold tonight. <laughs>